We are going to talk about the library that is considered the Microsoft Excel of Python, which is called Pandas. Here we will work with tabular data, and this is very essential for our machine learning and data analysis section. After completing this section, you'll have completed one of the most required skills companies ask for when they are looking for Python developers candidates, because Pandas is one of the most important tools to interact with external table files. So let's get this section started. So right now we are going to start talking about Pandas. Now Pandas is an important library that helps you work with spreadsheets. It can create tabular data, it can read Excel files, CSV files, and edit those files in any way that you would like, do some visualizations, help you edit columns and rows in a certain way, then resave the file. It's really a powerful library that is one of its main purposes is used in automation. Automation is like when you when you have a lot of work that involves spreadsheets and your work is really repetitive and it has a certain pattern and you would like to actually automate the process of this pattern so that you don't have to do it yourself. Every, so you would only write a small script. This script is going to automate the process and do the work for you. This will be also in another section of this course. But for now, let's get the basics of this Pandas library. Now, you all know what is a spreadsheet. It looks something like this. It has rows and it has columns, right? And it's very easy to create a tabular data like that using Python pandas library and then export it as a separate CSV or Excel file. Let's see how we can create a very small tabular data and save it as a CSV file. So the first thing you need to do is just import pandas. Uh, pandas is already pre-installed with the Anaconda distribution we have downloaded, so we don't really need to pip install it. Now let's create a new cell right here by pressing the B shortcut as we have learned. Now, let's say that I would like to create a small table. I'm gonna call it table, okay? And this table, let's say that it contains some names and ages, all right? So I would open a curly bracket the same way as I am creating a dictionary that contains lists. We have talked in depth about dictionaries and lists, so, Imagine that you are creating a very regular one. So we would say here, our first key would be names. And let's open a list of the names again. Let's say John. And again, same examples, Mr. Hampshire. And let's take maybe Sarah. Okay. Now this is my first key. Let's put a comma and create our second key, which is age okay and also here we will have three ages we have 25 29 and 27 okay so so far we did not create anything special now let's convert this dictionary into a pandas data frame a data frame is just that excel table that you see okay so Let's create a new cell and we're going to say a new data frame, okay, df is equal to pandas dot data frame and then you pass it which dictionary you would like to convert to a table or a data frame. In my case, it's called table, right? I want to convert this into a tabular data. And that's it. Now, let me execute these cells one by one, shift enter. Shift enter, shift enter. Okay, now let's try to print this DF. So I'm going to say print DF. As you can see, it turned it into a table. See, it has indexes. This is index 0, 1, 2. This is the first column, which has the names, and this is the age. Now, on the other side, if I try to print this table right here before converting it to a data frame, I'd be getting a dictionary. But what I got here is a table. That's great. Right now, we need to convert this tabular data into a CSV file. 
which can be opened with Excel or Open Office or whatever editor you will you would like to open with. So I'm just gonna say df dot do csv. Now this is my df, and I'm saying since this is a data frame right now, I can convert it to a CSV file. I need to say the name of the file. It's going to be let's say data dot csv. And here I have another option which is index. I can add this option or I can just ignore it. If I say index equals zero, this column of indexes right here, zero, one, two, will not be exported. Now, if I just leave it like this without the index, it will be exported. So let's say initially that we would like to export it. Click on Shift Enter. Now let's go and check our file. Now this is my file, it was exported right here because this is the directory I have opened my project in, in Anaconda prompt. Okay, so if I open this, you'll see that I have named A012 in an Excel file. Now, let's say I don't want this column, so I just need to say A index is equal to zero. Now we have run this one more time, let's reopen the data. As you can see now, we don't have the indexes, the 012 that we have seen before. Okay. What I want to talk about right now is reading from a CSV file. So I have this CSV file right here, and it has some sales. It has the order date, the region it was bought from, the city, the category, the product, the quantity, unit price, and the total price. Okay. And it's a list of 245 rows and I would like to read this into a pandas framework and work on it maybe edit some stuff maybe edit some columns I don't know I just want to read it first into a data frame so the first thing we are going to do is to import pandas as pd okay so right now instead of typing pandas every time I just need to type pd now I'm going to say df or data frame is equal to pd dot read underscore csv. And now I need to pass the file path that I have. So this is where my file is. I just need to copy the whole path and just put it like that. Now, if you are saving this uh, Jupyter Notebook in the same directory as your path right here, you really don't need to do that. All you need to do is just type the file name, okay? So far, this is the path, but we don't have the file name. Let's go and get it. So this is my file name. I'm copying all of it. And let's add this. And this is my file right now. Now, this won't be read correctly. We need to convert it into a format that can be read. So we need to double every slash we have right here, okay? Now we are ready to read this. If I execute it by hitting on Shift Enter, now I have a DF. If I just try to print this DF, as you can see, I got my DF right here. But as you can see as well, we are having an issue. We are having the order date, region, city, category, product, quantity, but unit price and total price are not embedded on the right right here and also the data frame is cropped so what can we do to fix this issue well let's try another function instead of print which is called display okay but first we need to import this display how can we do that well we need to say from ipython.display import display okay now let me rerun this uh yeah python here is with capital letter try again okay we're good now let's try to display this as you can see right now the formatting is way better after we use display we can see the excel file as it is we can see the csv file as it is with all the columns correctly but still we have a cropped the data well we can change this actually by setting this option to display all the rows how can we do that we can say simply pd dot 
that option underscore option and then we would just say display dot max row so display dot max underscore row okay now if i hit on shift enter we still need to pass one more argument let's pass none here and we're good now if i try to rerun this display you'll see that i can see all my entries nothing is cropped the columns are consistent next to each other so this is great so what we have learned right now is how to read an excel file and display it correctly so always with data frame add this option and of course if the size is reasonable if you have thousands of those you really might not want to do this okay if you have a couple hundreds maybe it makes sense and then use always display on data frames and do not use print so that you can have this nice format all right so far we have learned how we can display and read csv file but what about if i would like to filter these data what do i mean by that let's say that i first let's make sense of what data do we have we have multiple products like carrots wheat chocolate chips and there is categories for them and there is where is the city that is originating from well let's say that i would like to filter this data to only the products that have carrots so that i can see maybe where is the city they are coming from what is the region they are coming from what is their prices but i only want the carrots how can we do that well what we need to do is let's create a new variable call it filter product okay and let's call a method on the data frame and this method is called lock okay this lock if we just pass it the data frame column that we need and pass it the keyword that we are looking for it's going to filter our table right here so what i mean by that what do we want to filter i want to filter carrot well where is carrot carrot is in the column that is called product so first thing i need to say where is the column it's product just open df, open a parenthesis like that, and just say product. Okay. Then you want to say, what do you want to filter? Which keyword? Well, I just need to pass equal equal, and I'm going to pass, well, carrot. Make sure that the capitalization of the letter is correct. And just hit shift, enter to execute. Now, if I simply display this filter product, as you can see now, I have only the carrots. Now I can tell where, which city they come from, which category, the prices. I have all the information only for carrots. Well, that's really good. How about, let me delete this. How about if I have two conditions, like I want to filter for all the carrots that come, let's say, from Boston. And I just want those. I don't want any other things so my criteria is boston and carrot well i'm gonna copy all of this the same thing we have created but right here after carrots i'm gonna add the and symbol and i'm gonna put these in parentheses okay the df product all right and i'm gonna open a new parenthesis and do the same thing so df Open a bracket. We are filtering now for city, right? So we care about city. And this city keyword should equal to Boston. Okay. So this is a new filter. Now, if I execute it and I display filter product, as you can see right now, I only have carrots that are from Boston. Okay. So these carrots were ordered on the 1st of January 2020 so and the quantity was 33 this was ordered in another date with a quantity of 54 I can filter my data in any way I want well that's really great you can add as many conditions as you want when you are filtering
Okay, let us add one more technique to this mix. Let's say that I would like to sum up the total price for this carrot Boston that I have created. How can we sum up a certain column? Well, it's also very simple. Let's create a new variable. Let's call it total price, maybe. And then we're going to say filter product because we are going to use this data frame, the filtered one. You can also use the non filtered one, the DF, but in my case, I just want to use the filtered one. So this is filter product. And then I would put here the total price column, right? So I need to sum up my total price. And just call the method sum. Okay. And just print total price. As you can see, we got the summation really fast. Let's say I want to sum the quantity for this filter. So all I need to do is copy everything. Let's put it in a new cell. And here I just need to pass quantity. One. So it did sum my quantity. That's really good. Now be careful if you have an, a typo, let's say in the key, you'll get an error. So you need to make sure that the key is correct. You can use the techniques we have used in dictionary in order to check if a key exists or not before you just filter. Okay? Alright, so what else is necessary right here? Okay, so let's say that we would like to add a new entry right here. How can we do that? Well, we can simply use the append method in order to do that. But first, we need to prepare the entry. How can we prepare the entry? Well, it's very simple, actually. You need to create a dictionary with all the entries you have. So, let's see. These are my columns. So, those are my keys that I need to plug in. So, I'm going to say new entry is equal to, let's start a dictionary with all the keys. So, this is the order date. Let's say that it equals to... 1, 1, 222. Let's continue. We have the region. Let's say it is south. Let's continue. We have the city. Let's say it is Boston. We have category. Let's say it is bars. Okay. We also have the product. Let's say it is the carrot. And we have the quantity. Let's say it is 87. We have the unit price. Let's say that it is 155. And we have the total price. Let's see, what is the total price? It is 87 times 1.55, 134.85. Okay. Now, what we need to do is just say df.append. What do you want to append? The new entry variable, the dictionary we have just created. And that's it. Now, if I run this, we will get an error and it will say, you can only append if ignore index is true. So we need to pass here ignore underscore index equals true. This is a condition and this is the only way we can append to a data frame. So let's try again. Now let's go all the way down. We'll see that we got our entry south, Boston bars, carrot, eight, seven, and this is exactly what we are looking for. This is how we append a new entry. Now you can store this as we have learned before. Now we can simply say just df.2 underscore csv and just give it the same name maybe that we have read. So in our case, we can just copy all of this. And this should right now 
replace the data frame we have with the new one with the new entry if we execute it okay maybe you need to pass index is zero because i don't want the indexes okay now it's not really practical to put these every single time right so is there a better way now it happens a lot that when we read a data set especially when we are working with large data sets that some of the columns might not be important to us so in order to reduce the processing time we would like to maybe throw away those columns then continue with the processing the way to do that is by using a method that is called drop so let's say the region here is not important and let's also say that the category is not important how can we delete those? We can simply just say df, which is the df we have read here, equals to drop. Okay, now what do you want to drop? You just pass the column name. So in my case, I have region. Of course, you pass it as a string. And I also want to drop my category. So this is drop, open a bracket, string, category. Now, if I run this, now, we get an error and it says that axis is not found. Well, because we need to pass as well the axis we want to work on, which we, I will explain in a minute. Here we need axis one, so is here. So what does this mean? Well, axis one means I am working on columns, right? So I'm trying to delete these as columns, okay? Now axis has more into it a little bit, but to simplify it for you, just remember that axis 1 is acting on columns and axis 0 is acting on rows. So, since I'm trying to delete a column right here, all I need to do is pass axis 1. Now, if I try again, you will see that, well, I still have the region, but the category is gone. Well, why is that? Because you need to save this again. So you need to say df equals df drop. So you are update so you are updating your df. Okay, otherwise you'll be dropping it and just maybe printing it and you're not storing it anywhere. So you need always to store it. So df equals drop. Now if I run this and I just say display df, you'll see that. I don't have a region and I don't have a category. All right, so we are still learning about the methods we can apply on a data frame. Right now, we are going to learn how can we rename the header of the column. So here, this is called the header and it has the column's names. Let's say that you are reading a data frame and you would like to change one of those column names what can you do well there is a very simple method that we can apply it's called rename so we will say df equals df so that we can update the original df dot rename and then we open a parenthesis and then we open a small dictionary with the name of the column that we wish to change its name let's say we would like to change the order date to purchase date Okay, so here we would say order date need to be changed to, let's say, purchase date, just by passing this simple uh, dictionary. Okay, and also we need the axis. Again, here we are working on columns, so we would like to change that column. Okay, now if we just compile by hitting Shift Enter and just then say display df. You're going to see now that I have a purchase date instead of the order date. All right, so let's learn how we can delete certain rows in our data. Let's say that I know the rows that I want to delete exactly. So I know their indexes. So this is the index column here. And let's say that I want to delete index 1 and index 3. Okay, so we will use the drop method. So I'm going to say df equals df. I'm doing this because I want to update my original df that I have read. Okay, so this would equal df.drop and then I'm going to say df.index 
because I want to select certain indexes. Now, index here takes a list, okay? Since I want to be dropping multiple indexes, I need to open another bracket, okay? Because I have multiple ones. It is originally takes indexes like that if I have one index, but if I have multiple ones, I need to open another bracket. So I have double brackets right now, and now I can enter multiple indices. So I'm going to say one and three. Okay, now let's compile everything. Okay, the first one and the second one. Now let's say display df. You'll see that one and three are gone. Okay, that's good. But this will mess up our indexing because as you can see now, the indexing was not reordered one more time. So how can we fix this? Well, we need to say df reset index. So we need to apply the method that is called reset index, which after deletion, it will reorder these again and give us this will be one, this will be two, this will be three, and it will reorder it. So I'm going to say df dot reset underscore index. And right now, if I run this, you'll see that I got double indexes. Well, this is not exactly what we are looking for, right? Because it added another index column. Well, in order to fix this, we need to pass it drop equals true. Now, let me recompile this. So I'm going to recompile this one more time. That drop will be recompiled one more time. The display. So as you can see, the indices are gone. Now if I try to apply this one more time, you'll see that after passing drop equals true, it did not add another index column, but it corrected whatever I dropped before. Now the indexes are ordered correctly. So it's really recommended that if you use this dropping by index, you just also call the df reset index one more time okay so here we will say df equal df index let me recompile everything one more time and display df and by that we got what we are looking for so always df drop for indexes follow it by a reset index Let's talk a little bit about plotting. Let's say that you would like to plot this unit price column, okay? And this plotting will tell you the unit price and how many times it occurred in this whole data set. Well, this could be important in some cases. The way to do that is just by saying, let's say plot here is equal to df.histogram. So I would like to create a histogram for my data. So here I would say column. Let's say I want to plot the unit price. I'm just going to pass it the name of the column I want to plot. Okay, now if I compile this, as you can see, I got a plot of the unit price. And it's saying here that the value, let's say, of unit price 1.5 was barely repeated. And let's say the values between 1.5 and maybe here, which is maybe 1.7, was repeated over 80 times. So here, when you say the value in between 1.5 and let's say 1.7, it was repeated around over 80 times, actually. And here it says that maybe the value of 2.5 has never occurred. See, so it is actually plotting as a histogram, the unit prices with respect to the repetition that it is occurring in the whole data set. Now, let's try total price maybe. So this is the total price. You'll see that the total price of around maybe between uh, 50 and 102 or 3 was repeated over 140 times. And let's say maybe when we talk about 500, it was repeated only a few times. So as you can see, the histogram shows the relationship between the numbers here and their occurrences. You can apply this for quantity, any numeric column, 
but it has to be numeric actually in order to be plotted like this. So this quantity, you'll see that we have the quantity right now. Let's talk a little bit about plotting. Let's say that you would like to plot this unit price column, okay? And this plotting will tell you the unit price and how many time it occurred in this whole data set. Well, this could be important in some cases. The way to do that is just by saying, let's say plot here is equal to df.histogram. So I would like to create a histogram for my data. So here I would say column. Let's say I want to plot the unit price. I'm just going to pass it the name of the column I want to plot. Okay, now if I compile this, as you can see, I got a plot of the unit price. And it's saying here that the value, let's say, of unit price 1.5 was barely repeated. And let's say the values between 1.5 and maybe here, which is maybe 1.7, was repeated over 80 times. So here, when you say the value in between 1.5 and let's say 1.7 it was repeated around over 80 times actually and here it says that maybe the value of 2.5 has never occurred see so it is actually plotting as a histogram the unit prices with respect to the repetition that it is occurring in the whole data set now let's try total price maybe. So this is the total price. You'll see that the total price of around maybe between uh, 50 and 102 or 3 was repeated over 140 times. And let's say maybe when we talk about 500, it was repeated only a few times. So as you can see, the histogram shows the relationship between the numbers here and their occurrences. You can apply this for quantity, any numeric column, but it has to be numeric actually in order to be plotted like this. So this quantity, you'll see that we have the quantity right now. All right, so right now I am going to be talking about date filtering. So date filtering actually works a little bit differently from filtering per se a product, certain entry or a category, certain entry. We would like to filter dates in between, let's say, two dates. Okay, so let's say that I want only all the sales or all the order dates that are in between January 2022 and December 2022. So, and can we do that? Because here I have entries for 2021 as well. So maybe I don't need that. I only need for a certain year or for a certain month. So this is really important. How can we implement? It? Well, the first thing we need to do is to convert this order date into a date time that Pandas can understand. Okay. So Pandas has its own formatting that we can convert into. So the way to do that is by simply just passing the order date column and convert it into a date time, okay? Which is a Pandas method. So df, and we're going to say here order date, meaning here I want to update this order date into a different format. And I'm going to say pd dot to underscore date time and then i'm gonna just pass what do you want to convert well i want to convert this df order date okay so i'm converting this order date column into a date time format that pandas works can work with and then i am updating it by restoring it in the same column okay now I'm going to hit shift enter to execute. Now, if I try to display this DF, you'll see that the formatting has changed. It was considered as day, month, year with the slashes in between them. But now it is year, month, 
day and there is dashes in between them okay so this is the format that a pandas work with but you don't have to worry and to actually know what is the format that it works with all you need to do is first convert it okay second what you need to do is to choose a time period so we need two dates to filter right we need from a certain date to a certain date right so we'll say here date one or let's say just date one is equal to pd okay dot two underscore date time all right let's say you don't know the pandas format you can just plug in your own format that you have in your data in my case i'm just gonna say one one 2020 because for some reason maybe i don't know the formatting that pandas use i'm using my own formatting and i am converting it to what pandas understand then day two is equal to i'm going to copy this and maybe here i will plug in let's say until 30 december okay this is the second date so now i will only have entries from 2020 okay now the way to filter dates is actually by using a method which is called between okay bear with me we are going to say filtered filter date is equal to df open a bracket and pass the actual order date here so you need to say df dot and you need to put the column name right here like this okay not as a string but as it is so order date then you need to pass the method between now we are ready to filter in between two dates what are the two dates that i want to filter with date one and date two that i have created this is date one and this is date two okay so to recap you get your column you convert it to a date time you get the first date in your own format you convert it to date time second date same thing and then you just pass the name of the column and the method for the two dates okay but before we run this we just need to add a small quotation here okay this is much better because it's a string actually now let's run it and let me display filter date now let's take a look we should not be having any 2021 and we don't have any 2021 everything is for 2020 from the date we have given to the end date we have given okay let's say i would like only the entries for maybe january so i would say here until 31th of january 2022 only this time period now we need to reload the data set one more time now let me just compile this and run as you can see now i have only the january entries so by that we can create date filters actually for our csv files now it's time to build the front end of your software so far we have been working with command line which is really boring and ugly and not really user friendly when we want to deliver our customer a software, do you think that we use this boring command line? Actually, no, we use what we call GUI. Now, GUI programming helps us build nice user interfaces and windows. Do you see all of those menus and buttons we see in various apps? Well, it is exactly what GUI programming is. And Python has a lot of capabilities to use those functionalities. So let's build some software frontends. Welcome back to you guys in this new section where we are going to be covering GUI. Now GUI is applications that have those nice windows. So far we have learned how to create applications using CLI or the command line. And the application use interface there was fine and it was doing the job, but it was not really user friendly. When we are creating an app that 
people without knowledge in programming will use, using a CLI is not really the best idea. We need to use something more user friendly like a GUI. Now, we've all seen softwares with GUI. The, the software I am using now in order to draw all of this information is GUI. Why? Because it consists of a window, it consists of some buttons, it consists of a space to do some operation like drawing or maybe typing some text. It contains toolbars where we have some tools to do some certain things. We have a browsing bars and we have some option bars. So GUI is actually important to create those beautiful user interfaces. There are multiple libraries that are famous in Python to do that. One of them is called PySimple GUI. We also have tkinter. Those are the most famous ones. We are going to start simple with PySimple GUI. Now, PySimple GUI is actually built on tkinter, but it uses easier interfaces. I'm really excited to start this section with you guys because you are going to be building some really cool apps using these techniques. Let's get started. Now we are ready to start programming. The first thing we want to do is actually to install the library, which is called by simple GUI. Do the pip install for that, hit enter, and let it download. All right. I already have it installed. You can do that too. Now let us create some very, very simple GUI. I'm going to be importing here by simple GUI as SG. This is the shortcut for it. Now, to create anything, you need what we call a layout. A layout is where you put your buttons, you put your text fields, your drop down menus. And the way to create a layout is just by saying layout as a variable. And the layout is actually coded using lists. You open a large list and you start putting your elements. Let's say that I only have a text field. So we open a list dedicated for the text field like that. And then let's put it down here. So this is the opening and the closing for the whole layout, and this is for the individual elements. So let's create a text. We need to say sg.text like this. And then let's say here, this is my first app. Okay. We only want to start with a simple text like this to be displayed in our window. Now we need to create something called a window. A window will contain the title, the layout, the variable, and some additional information like the size. So here I will be creating this window and it is going to be sg.window like that. All right. And then we will be passing the name and I'm going to call it uh, app. And then we will be passing the layout and the window size. So let's say that the size here is equal to 800 or maybe 600 by 400 pixels, okay? And by that, we have created the window. Now, the last step is to create an infinite loop that will keep executing. We say while true. Now, inside this while loop, we need to be reading the events that are happening in our GUI. Events are like stuff where we are clicking, or maybe we are getting values from text fields or from buttons. All of these need to be read, right? So we have event and values is equal to window.read. Okay. We are reading the window right now. The next final thing I want to take care of is when I close this window. I'm going to say here if event is equal to equal sg.win underscore closed, then I would like to break. And finally, I would like to say window.close. Okay. This is the basic block in order to build the simplest GUI app out there.
okay you need the layout you need a window to pass the layout to and specify the size you need an infinite loop that will be reading this window and checking for events and values to be read and finally you want to check if the window is closed now if you close the window this window read is going to give an event here that is called when closed okay so you really need to memorize this as you when closed because this is what by simple gui returns when the closing event comes back from the gui okay now let us execute this and this is our first window as you can see we got a text saying this is my first app this is the title and this is a window of 600 by 400 size this is the simplest thing we can create with this small code now let's build a little bit on that what i would like to do right now is to take an input from the user and print it because the whole goal of a user interface is that we take information from the user and then we process it the same as we were taking arguments from cli we'll be taking arguments as well we can call them from the gui but in a more elegant way let's create a text field and this text field will be just below this one so if you put a comma here after this list and create a new list and you just say sg dot input text and open a parenthesis like that you will be having a text field now if i run this you'll see that i have a text field where i can write stuff in it let's create a button as well i'm gonna open another list and i'm gonna say his sg dot button and i'm gonna call this button okay or done now if i execute this you'll see that now i have a text field and i have a button which i can click but it still does nothing all right now how can we register what's going on here let's create a second button but this time next to this button okay which we will call save now if you put two elements in the same list they will be next to each other in your layout we will talk about how we can lay out later but for now let's put two buttons next to each other by doing this so we say sg button and this one is going to be called let's say send or save or it could be anything okay now if we run this you'll see that now i have two buttons all right so by that we have created more buttons and input text but we still did not get the input from the user What we are going to learn right now is how to catch events. It's very simple to catch an event with by simple GUI. Every element can be assigned a special key, okay? For example, this button here which is done, I could assign it a special key that I can use to read its own event. So here if I say key is equal to done, okay? Let us uh, distinguish keys by adding an underscore then done like that and for the send button let's also do the same so we have key is equal to quotation underscore send underscore okay right now we have a key or a distinguisher for these buttons see this is where we read events all we need to do is just say if event which are being registered while we are reading the window is equal to let's say send what i would like to do here i would like to print all the values that are stored right now values is for elements like text field or uh, drop down menus all the choices or the text that you write there will be stored in values okay we can also give special keys to these values like for input text but for now let's just print values as it is if we press on send now let's compile this now if i write something this is fun and i just hit on send oh i did put two underscores there so let me remove one now let's try again 
if I hit this is fun and hit on done and hit on send, we will be getting here this is fun from this dictionary. Now, values is a dictionary of all the input text and drop down menus. For example, if I am here to say uh, key is equal to underscore input underscore, okay? Now, I'm going to close this window and rerun it. And again, this is fun. Hit on send. You'll see that instead of having a key equaling zero, I got a key equaling input. All right. So here, this key was conveyed here. And now this dictionary key is actually the key of my input here. What does this tell me? Well, it tells me that I can access this value key like a regular dictionary, right? Meaning that if I have two of those text fields, okay, I can just say this is input one as a key and this is input two as a key. All right, let's put a comma here. And now if I print values, see we have two text fields. Let's say this is text one, this is text two, and if I hit on send, I will be getting here text one and text two. How about if I wanna read a specific text? All I need to do is just say, if I hit on send, I would like to print a certain key. Let's say the key is that I wanna print is input one underscore, okay? I'm just putting the name of the key because this values is nothing but a dictionary as we have seen and demonstrated. Now let's try again. This is text one and text two. If I try to print now, I will print only values with input one, meaning that this is the first text input. Okay, so this is how we acquire values. Okay, now let us introduce a new element which we call combo. Combo can contain multiple elements and store them as a drop down menu, which can be very useful. Let's add the options that we would like to be in our drop down menu. I'm going to call this drop down and it's going to contain values like, I don't know, maybe some countries, USA, Germany, France, doesn't really matter. Just let us put a list here and then we can add them here i'm going to be opening a new list and i'm going to say sg.combo and then we are going to pass this drop down menu and i'm going to assign it a key which will equal to underscore drop one underscore okay now i'm going to be running this we forgot to add a comma here. After every list, you need to add a comma. Let's try again. As you can see now, we have this list that contains multiple elements. But as you saw, we can modify these. How can we prevent this modifying? And also, if you take a look here, the initial value is empty, okay? We can keep it as empty and also we can set a default value. So let's solve one problem at a time. Let's see how we can prevent this from being modified. We can simply pass a parameter here in the drop down that says read only is equal to true. Okay. Now put a comma here and let's try to execute it. We'll see that now we cannot type anything when we are choosing an option. That's good. Now, what about default value? Well, we can simply pass a parameter called default value and let it equal to, let's say, whatever we have as a first element in my drop down. So I'm going to say drop down, just take the first element, whatever it is. Now, if I try to run this, you'll see that I have a default value. Okay, so this is how we create combos. Sometimes we would like to see the options we are choosing without actually having to click on a drop down menu. We would like to just see all the options in front of us. And this element is what's called sg.listbox.
Now list box is very similar to drop down, but there is no drop down button. That means if we just pass it here, drop down all the options, we should be seeing them simply. Now, if I run this, you'll see that I have this list box. But the problem is not all the options are showing because the list box is really small. Well, luckily we can also change the size of this list box. All we need to do is just pass a parameter which is called size and then open a tuple and choose the size. Let's say it is uh, 20 by 5, for example. Now let's run. And as you can see now, I have this list box that contains all the options that I need. And this list box, once it is full, once the element size is larger than the list box, this scroll down will be activated on its own. Let's test this as well. Let me repeat these options just for the demonstration's sake. Now if I run it, you'll see that I have this scroll down activated. This is really great. How about we create a menu like the one we have on the top here, where it contains file, edit, help, or whatever options that we would like to add for our app. All we need to do is to actually create a new list here, and we are going... All we need to do is open a new list at the top here, and just say sg.menu. And we need to pass this menu to it. Now, how about we create this menu separately right here? I'm going to call this menu. And every element needs to be in its own list. So, for example, if I have file, this is the file. Let's say I have something like edit and something like help. Okay. Now, I will be passing this menu here. And we need a comma right here. Let me organize this a bit. So they will be like that. Okay, this is much better. Remove this gap. All right, now if I try and run this, you'll see that I have a top bar menu, but they are empty. I mean, yes, we are hovering over them and the color is changing, but they are empty. How can we fill options in these menus? All we need to do is to let's say we want to add options to the file okay what you need to do is add a comma and then open another list now this list will contain all the options so stuff like open maybe maybe we'll have an option for saving maybe we'll have an option to save as okay now Let's say for editing, we could have options, I don't know, something like font and size maybe. And the help, maybe it will contain only the about. So here we have about. Now let me rerun this. You'll see that now I have open, save, save as. This is my font and menu. This is my font and size, and here I have my help. So this is how we create a menu as well. So far, we did not add any icon to our app. As you can see at the spider here, for example, the spider editor, there is an icon that represents the app, and we can do that very easily using PySimple GUI. Now, if we run this app, we will see that the default icon is the Python programming language icon. Let's change this. If I am to navigate to where I am writing my program right now, there is a small icon that I have based here, and I'm going to be using it. It is just a T and X, two letters, which I created on the internet. These are called favicons, and favicons are used for icons and their extension is usually ICO. Let me show you how we can create some small icons. Now, I want to show you how we can create simple icons. If you just type favicon creator, and you'll see this website, which is called favicon.io. Now, this is a really great site, and you can 
generate different type of icons that you can use for your app. Now there is emojis, you can convert a picture to an icon, or you can even write a text and convert it to an icon. And this is exactly what I've done here. I had some text and converted it to that. Now let's try this text to icon. This is the preview of the final result. We can type a single letter, let's say U like that. We can change the color. See, it's really similar to the Udemy uh, icon right now. And you can change the background as you wish. You can make it circular, you can make it a square. So you can really create cool icons so easily. Now, if I hit on download, I will get I will get a zip folder. If I open it, I will be seeing here my icon. Copy this icon. Let me change the name of this so that they are not mixing with each other. I don't want to replace it. Now I'm going to paste it here. And now we have it here. Let's use it. If we simply go to the SG window and say icon and just give the name, which is favicon.ico like that, and try to run it, You'll see that now we have this icon on our app. That's really cool. One more element that I would like to add to my layout is actually the multiline, which is a large text field. Now, where would we use this text field? If you open any editor like this one, this is actually a text field. And there is a lot of apps that have a text editor embedded in them to do some functionality. Let's see how we can add that. I'm going to be adding it below my list box. So I'm going to create a list here, add the comma, and then I'm going to say sg.multiline. Okay. And then I need to specify the size. So the size is maybe 200 by a 200 field. And let's give it a key. The key will be editor, maybe. Okay. Now let's try this out. And as you can see now, we have a text editor. But you might see that now my button is not showing up because we have consumed all of my area here. And our window is not really extendable. We cannot enlarge it. Let us resolve these issues. Let's try adding a parameter that will allow us to expand the window we have. So far, we cannot do that. Let's close this app. Add the parameter, which is called resizable. This will be equaling to true. And then we add a comma here. Now let us run this one more time. You'll see that now we're having this arrow that will allow us to expand our window. But still, we cannot actually see the button we have. Even if we enlarge it to the max, we still cannot see this button. Well, the reason is that we are using a size of 600 by 400 by default, and this multi-line is going to be expanding. So it is all about the, the starting configuration that we are already doing. Now let's try to increase the size of this whole window so that we can fit all of our elements. Let's make it 800 by 600. Let's run. Now let's decrease the size of this multi-line. 200 by 200 is a little bit much in this case. So let's make it maybe 100 by 20. Now if I hit on run, you'll see that I have my text box here. If I expand it a little bit, you'll see that I have my done and send. But still, when I start this program, the default is that I don't have the buttons. So maybe I need to also increase the default size of my whole window to maybe 800 by 600. Now, as you can see, all of the elements are visible, even if I don't expand at all. Okay. All right. Now, the next thing we are going to learn is actually laying out. Let's see how we can do that. 
If we take a look at our app, we will see that all the elements are being stacked on top of, of each other. How about if I want to put the elements maybe next to each other? Well, there is multiple ways to do that, and it depends on the complexity of your laying out. Now let's try a simple two elements next to each other. How about we put these two text fields side by side? Well, this is my second input. If I just take this out, okay, and put it inside the list here, I will be having two elements. So the whole point is that if you want to put two elements next to each other, is to open a list, a list will be represented as a line, and then put two elements. So let me illustrate this to you. This is my app, okay? And I would like to put elements side by side like that. Now I have my layout variable right here. Layout is actually a one huge list. You can think about this one huge list as being the borders of this large window, okay? So those are the same, okay? Now, let's say that I would like to put two elements here like those. Here, this is a line. Every line is actually a separate list. As you can see, on the same line, I have two elements. So in the same list, I can say element one and pass arguments to it. And then I could say element two. And by that, I have two elements. Let's say I would like to create a new line. And maybe here I will have two buttons this time. Well, I would put a comma, open a new list, and just put something like button one, comma, button two. And I can stack as many elements as I want. Let's say that I would like to have three elements. One, two, three. Then I would come here, open a list, and add element one, two, three. So every list is actually a line. Okay? This is how we can stack them. If we come back here, we just need to close this parenthesis here. And... This is how it looks like right now. Let's see, after running the program, how it will look like. We will see that we have two text fields next to each other. That's really great. We can put three, four, doesn't matter. So let's try to put here the definition of this text field. Like, what does this text field mean? In our case, let's say that this is the name and this is the surname. All we need to do is to actually just say here, ch cg.text and say here the name and again before the second input so sg.text and then let's say here is the surname one more thing we can add is horizontal separators so a separator is nothing but a line that we can put in between elements we need to just create a list for it as usual and just pass something like H, like H, the separator. And we need to say SG here. And let's run it. We will see that now we have a horizontal line in order to divide those. Okay. This is how we create layout when we are stacking stuff on top of each other. And we can now kind of separate them into two sites. But what if my program is strictly about having two columns? So the design is not actually about a row, then splitting it, but rather than having a whole column right here and a whole column right here. It does not make sense that I need to go to both columns and see the elements on the right and on the left and then program them. There should be a better way. Let's see how we can do that. Now let's say that my design Now let's say that my design looks like this. This is my window and I have multiple columns. Let's say initially two columns. Okay? This is column 1 and this is column 2. As I said, it does not really make sense that I go to every column and just put the elements like this, especially if my design is strictly about column design 
okay what i need to do here is i need to find a way to write all the elements for this column then write all the elements for this column and maybe then we can combine them this is achievable actually what we need to do is first write all the elements of the first column so design column one and you can put them like the same way you are designing a regular layout you need a major brackets like that and then for every element you need to pass brackets okay it's like you are designing a horizontal type of stacking next you design your second column say you say column two again you open a large brackets and you put all of your elements like you are stacking them horizontally and then you will be using some method that will convert these into understandable layout and you stack them horizontally right because once you have all of these elements as column one and as column two well column one and column two together they are stacked horizontally so first you stack them vertically here you stack them as well vertically and finally here you need to stack them horizontally let's see how we can do that what i would like to do is to well i'm going to be stacking these together one more time so these fields will be on the right side both of them stacked vertically and then these two the combo and the list box will be on the right side okay the buttons will be also on the right side and initially i'm going to get rid of this uh, multi-line box okay let's do that i'm going to comment this out for a second i'm just going to throw it away somewhere initially now you need to design the each column individually so we have column one is equal to open a large bracket and then open the brackets for every horizontal one also i'm going to get rid of this menu just to simplify things a little bit i'm going to put them here and let's simplify this text need to be on the left side right i'm going to create a new column and as usual like we are creating a layout we need main bracket and then a bracket for every element so we have sg text i'm taking this sg text this is my first element let's continue we also have this input here we also have this sg text coming next i'm gonna put it in a separate bracket let's continue we have this input again separate bracket we have this text one more time separate bracket we have this one again separate bracket okay this should be it for our first column now let's create column number number two so this is column one let me remove this space and now arrange this a little bit okay now let's write column two now column two is going to have this combo open a larger bracket then open the bracket for the combo and we have also the list box this is my list box okay now we have the buttons as well so i'm gonna take both buttons and i'm gonna remove all of those initially okay so now i have column one all my elements that will be on the left and these are all the elements that will be on the right now how can we combine them there is a method that is called sg.column so it will convert this to a column all i need to do is just pass the column name so this is column one okay i'm gonna put this of course in a bracket now when you think about columns when two columns are next to each other since they are next to each other it means that they are horizontally aligned right that means two columns can be in the same list now sg column and we will pass column two now let's run this 
as you can see, my elements are stacked on the left and on the right. This is what we have expected. Now, how about we add a vertical divider in between them? Because right now they don't look really that good. We can simply do that here. I'm going to say sg dot vertical separator. Now, if I run this, you'll see that now I have this line. Okay. It does not look too bad. What I want to do right now is return the upper menu. This is my upper menu. We just commented it out like that away on the top. Now, since it will be on the top, I'm going to just put it here. Now I will treat this as just a simple element, right? And now I can continue stacking as usual. So this is my menu, and I also want my multi-line. So I'm going to take my multi-line, put it here, remove this huge space, and delete these two. Now if I run this, you'll see that I got my menu. I have a section where it is divided on the right and on the left into two columns, and then I continue the stacking horizontally like we were doing before. Laying out is really not that hard when we are dealing with PySimple GUI. And we can do tons of layout just by these simple techniques. Hello guys and welcome back to you in this new project which we will be writing using the PySimple GUI library. What we will be really designing this time is a text editor from scratch. You all know text editors like Notepad, they just let you type some text, maybe change the font, change the size of the text, and also saving and loading files. How about we create something similar using PySimple GUI? We are going to have a window like that, and this window will be our text editor, right? So all of this area here, down here, this is for text. We will be having a giant text box. Then here we have our menu, which could contain file, it could contain edit, and some about section maybe. And maybe in file we will be having save, save as, and then some maybe exit. In edit, maybe we can change font, maybe we can change size. And here we would be, let's say, displaying the version of our text editor. Well, it could, and here maybe we'll be having an open as well to open a new file and display it on our text editor right here. This is a really fun project. Let's dig into it and start implementing it. Okay, now we are ready to start writing our text editor. I have the basic template for a PySimple GUI, which consists of a layout, of course, and the window where we are passing the layout, and of course an infinite loop, so that we will be displaying this window and take the exit. If I run this app right now, I will get an error because actually my layout is empty, and that's expected. Let's call this app Elite Text. Editor. Okay, this is the name of my app right now. Let's start by creating an upper bar menu. Let's start by creating the layout. The first thing I need is actually a menu. I need an upper menu and I need a multi line window, right? The multi line window is used for the text editing itself. First, I'm going to be defining my menu really quickly. I'm going to say here menu is equal to open a large bracket and let's start putting all of our elements we have first file and then we need to specify what are the sub elements of the file which are open to open a new file and display it of course then we have save to save a file we also have save as to save the file with a new name maybe and we have close to close the editor. Next, we have the edit. We have edit here, 
and inside this edit we will be having two functions one of them is the fonts and the other is the size I'm going to have here font and these fonts are going to be as follows they should be there should be Arial and Courier we'll be supporting only two fonts we can add more but initially we will be choosing only these two we also need the size so we're going to create a space here and put a comma and open a new bracket we have the size and the sizes we will be supporting are actually 8 11 and then we have 18 and finally 22 and the last menu we will have is the about so i'm going to have here i'm going to call this about and inside this about we will be having only the version so we have the version of this app okay now let's create a menu here we are going to let me just expand this all right now we have sg.menu and we are going to pass menu to it what else we would like to have the multi-line of course which is the main element we have so sg.multi-line let's choose a size of let's say maybe 600 by 400 let us give it a key and call it maybe text and let's close the parentheses here we need we forgot to open a parentheses over there and we're good okay let's also make the app window size is 600 by 400 now let's run this we will see that we have this very small window which we are going to fix and also we have the file which contains open save save as and close we have the edit as you can see it contains multiple menus here for the font and the sizes and we have the about okay this is not a very bad start now let's try to run it again it seems that we are writing 600 by 400 here as a text we forgot to say that this is the size. Okay, so let's add size is equal to this. And now let us run it again. And as you can see, now we have a whole window where we can type our text. But so far, we don't have any functionality. I mean, we cannot do anything with this text that we have written. Let's add some functionality to that. Now, SG Multiline actually accepts a parameter that is called font. So if I say font here and I type Arial and then type next to it the size, I should be able to change the font and the size. Let's add an equal sign here. Now let's try to run this. We will see that the size has increased. Let's try changing the font. So let's say here that we have Courier. Let's run this. You'll see that the text is now different. What we need to do now is find a mechanism in order to update this font. How can we update this font actually? Well, let's set that the default here is Arial and with a size of 11. This is my default. I would like to create two global variables. One of them is called current size. Let's say it is 11 initially, and we have the current font, which is Arial initially. Okay, now you see all of those, each one of the names we have in our menu is actually nothing but an event. So here, if I add if event equals Arial and I go and click on Arial, I am going to be getting this Arial in my events. Okay, so let's do that. Let's say here that I clicked on the phone that is called Courier. So if event is equal equal to Courier, meaning that I clicked on this Courier, what I would like to do is I want to set this to Courier, right? But how can I up update it? Well, there is a method that we can use in order to update any element we want. All we need to do is just say window and pass the key name, which is in our case text. Okay, 
we want to update, we want to go to window, go to this multi-line text, okay, and update it. We will run a method called update. Now, what would we like to update exactly? I want to update my font. But as you can see, font here takes two arguments. It takes the size and the font name at the same time. So what I'm going to say here, font is equal to, since I'm changing it to career, it will be career, right? And what else? Well, it is going to be here, the size. What is the size? Since I did not actually click on changing the size, it only makes sense that I pass the current size, right? I stored the size somewhere else, so that if I want to change the font only, I pass the new font and just leave the size unchanged. So all I need to say here is current size. Okay. All right. I guess we have we took this break way too far. Let's return it to its place. Okay. Now let's try this career thing we have tried. Let's run and let's type something and then go to edit font career and you'll see that it changed. So this is how we change the font. How about we make it a little bit more organized? I'm going to say here font is equal to this and I'm going to just pass here font. Okay. Now it makes more sense. So this is for career. What if I want to change it to Arial? I'm just going to copy this, paste it as it is. I'm going to just say here Arial. So font now is going to equal to Arial and everything will be the same. Let's test this one more time. Let's type some things, some things, and let's change the font to it is Arial already. Let's change it to career. This is career. Let's change it to Arial back. Now it is Arial again. Okay. Before we move to the step where we change the font size, there is still one more step to change the font. We need to update the current font whenever we change it. So right here, we are going to say current font is actually equal to career. Because this will be very important when we change size. Because when we change size, we would like to take the current font and change the size, right? The same thing here, where we took the current size and changed the font. So it only makes sense that every time we update the font or the size, we change the current size and current font variable. Now, Let's say that we are changing the font. We'll say if event, what is the first font? We have eight. So if event equals eight, as simple as that. What are we going to do? We will say current font is equal to eight. We are going to say font is equal to current font and the new size, which is eight. And finally, we need to update. Here we have double equal sign, actually. And finally, we need to update. So I'm just going to copy this line, put it here, and that's it. Now, let's change for all the fonts. We have four fonts, so we need four of these. This is the first one. Second one here, let's say the font this time is 11, 11, 11. Then we have 18 and 22. This is for 18. And finally, we have for 22. Let's test this now. But first, let's close the application and run. Now, let's type something. This is a sentence. Now, let's try to change the font. This is career. Let's change the size to 22. We see the size is large. But as we are seeing right now, something is not right because when I am changing the phone to Arial, let's change the size to 22 and let's change the font back to career. We see that the size is 
actually not updating. Well, the reason is we forgot to change the variable name here. This one is the current size. So this is the size. 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 And size. Let us try it again. This is a sentence. I'm going to change this to 22. And I'm going to change this the phone to career. And we're good. Let's change it back to Arial. It is Arial. Let's shrink it down to 18. Change it back to career. It is already career. Change it to Arial. It is now Arial. This is how we change the size and the font. I don't know, but I'm... And this is really exciting because now we have our own small editor. Now we need to move to a little bit. Now we need to do two... St now we still need to do more functions. So let's start implementing them. Okay. Now let's create a very small function that is going to display this about and the version of our app. I'm going to create a function here. A very simple one. I'm going to call it about. Now we are going to create an element that is called pop up. So sg.popup and this will create a window containing some information. Let's say about this program version 1.0 beta. And then maybe I will type here the name of the app, which is Elite Text Editor. Elite Text Editor Copyright 2022 or 23. Now, when are we going to call this about whenever we have an about event? The event is called version. Okay, so we have version here. I'm going to say if event is equal to version, I would like to call the about function. As simple as that. Now, let's test this out. If I say about version, I'm going to get this. About this program, version 1, beta, elite etc let's click on ok ok now the next step is going to be these functionalities which are open save save as and close we can quickly code the close one by saying here if event equals as you closed or if event is equal equal to close then i would like to close the program let's test this out if i run it and i say here close I'm closing the program. Okay, now we still have three functions to cover. Okay, now let's go into the more advanced functions. They're really not that advanced, but they are stuff that are new to us that we need to understand. Let's start with the function that we use to save a file. Let's say that you have written some text here and you would like to actually save it somewhere, right? Well, to do that, we are going to first import a library that is called IO. Now, IO is used to read and write uh, variables and convert them into bytes. So this will convert our text, let's say, into a stream byte, which by simple GUI can understand and can use in order to store whatever we have written. How can we use this IO byte? I'm going to be creating a function here, which we will be calling save. Okay. And here I will be passing what is the data that I would like to save. So I'm going to pass data. We already know how we can write and save files using Python. We have already learned about that. And with IO, it's very simple. It's very similar. We need to say with io.open let's put an a default name here for example let's say data.txt since we are saving it means that we need to pass the parameter w meaning we are writing and we need to pass the encoding now every text on our computer has some sort of encoding and the universal one here is utf8 okay 
Now, after we do that, we just say as f, all right? And we just write the file. We'll say f write data. This will be all of our save file. We create a text file. Let's say we call it data. We prepare it to be in write mode. We set the encoding and just we pass lines to it, which is everything that we have in data. Now, what is data? I'm going to show you in a second. We are going to take the event save. So I'm going to say here if event is equal to save, then what I would like to do here, I would like to call the function save. But what is the parameter that I will be passing? I want to pass whatever I want to pass my data. And my data here is whatever I have written in this multi line. Now, where is the information stored? Where, where is the text that I have written stored usually? Well, it's stored in this, in the values, and by passing this key to it. What do I mean by values? Remember this variable? We have talked about it. It stores all the text that is written in a certain app, and we can access it by saying something like values, and then pass the key. Again, let's take a look. What is the key? Where are we going to get the information from? From this text, right? From the multi-line. So I'm going to pass here underscore text underscore. Okay. Now, when I hit on save, I'm expecting that it will be saved in the same place as my current script. So let's test this out. Run the app. Let's write something. This is our first line. Now let's hit on save. Let's go check. And as you can see now, I have my data here. If I open it, this is our first line. So saving the data initially has worked as expected. Well, so far so good. Now let us work on our second function, which is save as. Now save as is a little bit more complicated than save because we need to open a window that will navigate to the place where we want to save the new file. And then once we hit save, we want to get this path, okay, and then save it as usual. So here, when we hit on save like this, all we do is we are saving it in the same path as our script. But with save as, this is not the case. Save as main purpose is actually to choose a different location maybe and to choose a different name for our file. Okay, now, in order to open that window that says save as, like here, if I say save as, we need to open a window to do that. Now, PySimple GUI does not really support this save as window, but that's fine. Since PySimple GUI is built on take enter, it means that we can use the take enter functions in order to achieve this. Okay? Now, let us get our hands a little bit dirty. We'll say here diff save as. Let's create a file. Let's create a function here for that. Let's add an underscore here. And the same as in save, we need to pass the data. Now, the difference is in the first step. Now, follow with me. The main purpose of that window that I showed you here is when we are choosing the place where we want to save, it will give us back this whole path. This is the whole point of this window, to give a new name and returns, once we press save, it will return this whole path. Okay? So how can we get this whole path and this window? Well, we are going to say here file name, since we will be returning the path or the file name, is equal to sg.tkinter.filedialog.askSaveAsFileName. Okay, this is a little bit long, I know, but we need to do all of this. So, this is a method in the tkinter that we will be using in order to open that window and get the path. Okay, let's continue. We need to pass few parameters here. So we need to say default extension. And of course, it's going to be txt, right? Because we are saving txt files. Now, what's the next parameter? 
The next parameter is the file types that I can have. If I hit on save as, you'll see that here there is the supported types that I can actually include. So let's fill this out. I'm going to say here file type is equal to, it's actually types, open a parenthesis, and for every file type, we need to open a parenthesis. Here we're going to say all txt files like that and then inside this parenthesis we need to add a comma here then we still need to say all text files so we will be using the star dot txt meaning regardless of the name show me all the text files okay and also i would like to show all the files so i'm gonna Exit this first parenthesis, open a new one here, and say here, all files, and then pass all files. So, we pass the star dot star. Okay? It means that get me any extension, doesn't matter what it is. Alright, what is the next parameter? The next parameter is the initial directory. Where is the initial directory that I would like to open when I hit on save as? So if I press save as, as you can see, there is an initial directory. Well, I would like to open the directory of my script, let's say. We can actually open the directory of wherever we are at the moment when we are creating this text. Okay, so this can be done. Now, how about we get the directory of wherever the file is at this moment? We can do that by first importing the library OS, and then I would like to say uh, script path is equal to OS dot path dot directory name, and just pass file like this. What will this do exactly? It will take a look where is this script or where is this text file right now, and it will return the path to it. Okay. So here, initial directory is nothing but script path that we have created above. Now we need a title. What is the title of this window? So I'm going to say here, title is equal to save as. And by that, we are done with all the parameters for this file dialog. Now what's next is we are going to be using this same method we used for save. With one small difference is that here, all we need to do is just pass file name. Okay? So this window has opened. You chose a path with a file name. You clicked on save. Now this file name is actually a whole path with the file name attached to it. And now you are saying, hey, I would like to open a new text file with that certain name in that certain directory and just save it. All right, let's fix the indent here. And we're good. All right. Now, the last step that we want to do is to actually activate the save as. It is very similar to save. So I'm going to say here if event is equal to save, what was the name here? Save as, like this. This is the, this is what we are waiting for. I would like to call the function save as and take the text. All right. Now, let's run this. Let's type a text. This is my second text file. Save as. And as you can see now, I have this window. That's really cool. Now, let's say I would like to save it here. I'm going to say second text. Hit on save. And let's see what happened. Now, as we can see, we have this second text saved as we have expected. And this is my second text. And it saved it exactly where I wanted it to be. Well, that's really cool. Now, we are not really done with save and save as yet. We are still having some issues which we will discover right now. If I hit on run, okay, let's type a text. This is a text. And click on save. It will automatically save it as the following. It will go here and create a data.txt and just save it. We did not get to save the file the first time. I mean, take a look at Notepad. If I hit on save, 
the first time I open it, it will not automatically save the file in a random place, but it will open the save as window. See, you click on save. If it's the first time, it should open the save as. This is what I would like to implement right now. Let's create a flag here, and I'm going to call it first time app. If this is the first time that I am trying to save, okay, then it will be one. If it's not, it will be zero. Now I can implement a logic here in the save saying that if first time app is equal to zero, meaning that it is not the first time, then I can go and implement the save, right? Because this is the second time. That means I already have a path and I'm just saving to that certain path. Now, else I would like to implement a save as. So I'm going to just copy this and put it here. Okay. Now, once I do this, I would like to change this variable to zero, right? Does this make sense? It is initially one, meaning it's the first time we try to save. Is it the first time? No. Is the first time equals zero? No, it equals one. It means that I need to save as. Now first time app is equal to zero, meaning it's not the first time anymore. Now if I hit on save again, well, we will be just saving to the regular path. One more thing that we need to change is actually here in the save. This. What I would like to have is this file name, right? But how can we obtain it? Let's make it global. So I'm going to say global file name. We've talked about global when we were talking about functions in this course. Now I'm going to say here file name is equal to, initially it will equal to where we are, okay? This won't really matter. This is just a guardian so that the program does not crash, okay? So now, since the first time we will be saving, it will be a save as, we will be having a path, and this path will be the path we will be saving at. So here will be file name. Okay? Now this should be much better. Let's try it. Let's run. If I hit on file. Now let's say this is an app. If I hit save, it should not save it in a random place. It should take me to save as. And it did. I'm going to call this a save as file. Okay. Hit on save. Now, if I try to save again, it will actually save the file and it won't do a save as. Now, if I say this is an app, let's go and check it. Open the save as file. Now, it is. this is an app. Now, if I say this is an app that is really cool and just file save and open it it will say this is an app that is really cool now let's try the save as one more time let's change the name of the file this is new okay this is the this is a new and we have a new file now if i say this is really cool this is new and i just save and open this this is a new txt, we will be getting it. So now the functionality of save and save as is working as expected. Now our app is almost ready to be a fully functional text editor. We still have one more function that is called open. Open is going to open a file and display whatever content it has. So I'm going to define a new file, call it open, but don't call it just open because open is a keyword for Python. So just say open file, maybe like that. And now we are going to write it. Open is the same as when we were doing save as. We would like to open a file, meaning we would like to open a window to get its directory. So if I hit on open here, You'll see that it will give me a window where I can click, click on a file. If I hit on open, it will return the whole path with the file name attached to it. Okay, now, PySimple GUI do support an open window, unlike the save and save as. So in order to call this, I'm going to say here file open is equal to 
sg.popup underscore get underscore file. Okay, we need to pass a few parameters. We will say here file to open. This is the title. And we need to pass no window equals to true. All right. Now, these are the initial parameters. What is next? Well, we will be just opening the file. We will say with open file name. Then we need to pass that this is a read file. And we need to pass the encoding is equal to, again, UTF8. And here as F. And finally, we will say here text is equal to f.read. So this is just a regular way to open the file that we have learned when we were talking about reading and writing files. Okay. All right. Now, what's the next step here? We need to take that text that we have read, which is now stored in text, and just display it on our app. How can we do that? Very simple, window underscore text, right? This is our multi-line element, and I am updating it to display whatever file I have read. This is dot update value. What is the value here? It's equal to text, okay? Now, how about we add a title that shows the whole directory we are opening? We can do that by calling window.tkroot.title and then file open. We are taking this variable, which is the path, and we are showing it above. All right. Okay, now we're good. Now, the final thing we need is to read the event. So I'm going to say here, if event is equal, equal to open, then just call the open file. Then open file need to be called. Let's hit on run. Let's open a file, hit on open. And as you can see now, we are opening a file. Let's choose this one, second text. And we got an error. Mm, let's take a look and see why. Okay, here. We set file name instead of file open. Okay. All right. So we have used the wrong variable. Let's try again. If I hit on open, open this file. And as you can see now, I have opened the file. This is a great. We can see here as well that we have the file path being written up here. That's really cool. Now I would like you to see here what happens if I remove this no window. Currently, when I open this, and if I hit on open, I will get a window that looks like this. However, okay, we got another error while we are showing what's going on here, which we will be fixing. But you remember how the window looked like. Now, if I remove this no window true and I rerun the program, if I hit on open, you'll see that the dialog I am opening is the PySimple GUI one. Now, once you add this no window equal true, it will open the tkinter based window which is fancier and looks much better okay now we saw here that we got an error when we try to open and then close the window without opening anything what happened is when we open we are telling it hey use file open path in order to open a file but if we cancel it now file open is an empty string and here we are telling it to open a file with an empty string, meaning we have no path to open in any way. So how can we fix this? Now what we are going to do here, before opening the file, we are going to say, if file open, if file open is not equal to an empty string, meaning that we have canceled the opening window, then I would like to do all of this stuff. Okay, otherwise I won't. Now let's reset this and let's run this one more time. Now if I try to open a file and cancel it, I will have no issue anymore. That's really good. Now how about we see if we have a bug if we open a file and we try to save it. So if I hit on open now, choose a file, and if I hit on save, it will open a new window. Well, 
this could be an accepted behavior or maybe not. For me, it's okay that if I open a file and I hit on save, it will tell me if I want to save it somewhere else or give it a different name. That's okay. But most text editors won't allow this. They, If you hit on save after you open a file, it will automatically go and save this file. Okay. Now we see that even when we hit save, we had the same issue for the empty string. So let's fix this as well. So in the save as here, we are going to say if file name is not equal to empty string, then do all of this stuff. Now let's see if this works. I'm going to run this. Let's open the same thing. We need to open a file, try to save it, and then cancel. As you can see, no, we have no issue. But now the flag was set to zero again. So if I hit on save, I will get the same issue because save also need the same mechanism. I'm going to say here again, if file name is not equal to empty string, then I would like to do that. Okay, this is called debugging. And every software you will write ever, you will find tons of bugs in it that need to be fixed before you can release it. And this is the process that I am letting you go through. Now, let's try again. If I hit on this, to run. Now, if I open a file, we're good. If I save it, click cancel, we are still good. If I save it again, we're good. All right. So we can still improve a lot on this app. But for now, for an initial version, we can actually release it. The next step is how can we take this app and convert it into an executable file so that we can open it without looking at all of this code, okay? Because you want to distribute the file, maybe you want to share it on the internet, and you would like people to use your app, so they need to download it as an .exe file, let's say if you are on Windows, and they need to launch it, right? Let's see how we can do that. All right, now we are going to talk about the topic of converting any Py program into an .exe. Right now, for example, I have this .py file, okay? And as we know, this .py file is this our text editor where we can save and load text files, and we can change fonts, and we can change size. All of these are actually inside this text.editor. But let's say you want to distribute your app or your Python file and maybe send it to customers so that they can run it. Of course, you're not going to be sending the .py file. This makes no sense. What you would like to send them if they are running this on Windows is the .exe extension file so that you can launch it and work with it without even having to deal with code. I mean, this is the case of any software that you download from the internet or you purchase, right? So, how can we do that? We are going to open Anaconda, and we are going to install something called Py Installer. Okay? Now, Py Installer is going to take a Py file and convert it into an .exe. How can we do that? You need to navigate to your to the same directory as your Py file is. I am in it right now. All you need to do is just say cd, copy the path, and just go there, okay? If your path is in a different, let's say in C instead of D, you need to say C first, and then go to cd, and here go to your C file, okay? But since everything by me is, but since everything I have is in D, I need to go to D first, and then navigate to this D directory. Now. Let's continue. What you need to do is type py installer, okay? If your program is a GUI, meaning if it is a window like that, you want to pass no console, okay? Because if you don't pass this no console, we are going to get a command line window like that once you open your uh, program, which makes sense if your program is actually nothing but a command line interface, like if you created a CLI interface. 
But right here, we have a GUI, so I don't really want to open any command line. So I'm going to say no console. Next, if you have an icon for your app, you can add it here. You're going to say icon is equal to, and just make sure that the icon is in the same directory as your by file, and just give the name of your icon. So here we have favicon.ico, and finally, you need to pass the name of your py file. So here we have text editor.py. Okay, this is it. Now hit on run and let it execute. It's going to take a minute. As you can see, folders are building up right now in this directory. We also need to pass one more thing. What I want to do is I want to have a single file, meaning that I don't want a full distribution with files laying around. I just want to create one exe file. Now there is one more parameter which is called one file. Usually when you install any software, you open its target folder and you will see multiple files and folders that they are laying around next to that exe extension. What I want to do is I don't want to have any of those files. I just want to create one single exe file, okay? Everything will be compressed in there. So if I execute this, it will take a minute. And we are good. Now we need to go to the distribution folder. And here is our text editor. Now don't be fooled. Sometimes the icon here is not updated. All you need to do is just copy it and put the exe somewhere else. And you'll see that it is working. Now, if I open this file, this is my app, and it is fully functional, as you can see. We can change the font, size, we can save, we can do everything we want. And now we have a fully functional text editor of our own. Congratulations on completing this cool project. How about we create a cool application that will recommend us the top Netflix series? Well, this is exactly what we are going to implement in this section. We will be getting data containing all of the series existing on Netflix. And we will scrap this data to figure out the top 10 series in any genre we want. This also forms the basics of recommender systems that we find let's say on social media apps, like those who recommends you the best next thing to buy on Amazon, or what movie should you watch next after you have finished a movie on Netflix, let's say. We call these recommender systems, and we are going to implement some applications around them. So let's get started. Okay, we have talked quite a bit about how we can use pandas with datasets. Now, where can we get datasets from? Let's say you want to practice working on different data, or maybe you have a project regarding a certain area that you would like to have data for. Well, Kaggle is your target website. Kaggle has the largest datasets around the internet, and it has datasets for Spotify, for Netflix movies, it has for medical stuff it has it has data for almost everything actually and we are going to get one of these data sets and we are going to create a project using that so all you need to do is go in and create an account and then the project is going to be about netflix actually so what we need is a list of all the Netflix series or movies, and we are going to extract what are the top 10 movies that we have. It's like a very simple recommendation system or a recommender system. This recommender system is going to give me, let's say, what is the top 10 movies in comedy, in drama, in action. It can do that for me using the data set that I will provide for it. Okay, so please create an account there, and let's get started. 
Right now, we are ready to start programming our project. First off, we are ready to import all of our libraries. So we will start with pandas, spd, and then we need the display. We have talked about display before, so we need i from ipython dot display import display. Okay. This is all we need so far. Let us compile this and move to a new cell by hitting on Shift Enter. We are going to start defining our functions. The first function we will write is to read the CSV data. We are going to define a function called read file and we will pass it a path, which is the path of the file we will be reading. Okay. Now, what I want to do is, I want to create here a new cell by hitting on B. Now, I'm going to be defining an empty data frame. We'll be writing df is equal to none. Okay, this will be a global variable that all of our functions will be able to access. We have talked about this in this tutorial series. So right here, the first thing we will be doing is by creating a global for this DF so that when we read the CSV file, we will be assigning it to this data frame, okay, the global one. Now we will be saying DF is equal to pd.read underscore CSV. And then what is the path of my CSV will be passed through this function. I'm going to create a new cell to test whatever functions I am calling. Okay, so I'm going to hit here and press B. And I'm going to say here read file. And I just need to pass the path. Let's go and get the path. So this is my file. It is in this directory. I just need to copy the whole path like this. And we will add the file name. We will add a slash here. Okay, so we will double all the slashes we have. We will be doing this in case we are in, on Windows. Okay, so this is my path. And let us compile this. We have an error because here we forgot the D. Let us recompile. Okay, so right now we are ready to compile all the cells. We have this one, this one, and finally we have this one. Okay, so we have read the file. Now if I try to display DF, this is my DF. It has title, the title of the movie or the series. It has the year. It has the duration, genre, rating, description, stars, and the numbers of votes. So it has all the information that I need. But as we can see here, we have some columns that are not really useful to us. Like the description, maybe. We have the certificates, the stars. We will be dropping all of those by creating a new function that will clean the data set. All right, let's continue with our program. So far, we were able to read our CSV file and display it. Now, what I want to do is clean this data set. So I'm going to define a function that is going to clean this data set, meaning that I would like to actually drop some of the columns that I will not be using. For example, the year, the certificate, duration. I'm going to need the genre. I'm going to need the rating. I don't need the description and I don't need the stars. So I'm going to keep only three columns, which are the votes, genre, and the title. Next, when you try to read out this, now, when you try to read out the votes numbers right here, you're going to notice that they are strings. So we cannot really perform any numerical operations on them, and that's not really good. So we need a way to convert those numbers into integers. 
right? So we cannot really handle strings for calculations. Let us see this data set first as it is, so I can show you what else we are missing. I'm going to add here a new cell. I'm going to add it under the imports, and it will be the display. So I want to display all the CSV files. And the way to do that is by simply saying pd.set underscore option double quotation display dot max underscore rows and then we will be passing none here now if i compile this and i will it will take a minute to display all the 10,000 entries and here we go now we can see all the entries as you can see we have them all 9956 if you notice let's say here we have entries that are not applicable because they are empty okay so we don't have any votes maybe for them or we don't know the stars so we will find a couple of these. See, all of these are NAN. All the NANs are empty entries, and we need to replace them with zeros. So this is also one more thing that we need to add to our pre-processing function. Okay, so let us get started. Let's break this into sections. We are going to start with deleting the unnecessary columns first. So. Here, I'm going to define clean dataset function. I'm not going to pass anything to it, and it will be modifying this global variable, the df. So I'm going to say global df. Okay. Now, do you remember how we remove the column that we don't need? We use the drop method. So we need to say df equals df.drop, and then simply open a parenthesis and just say the name of the column in a bracket so we need to drop uh, the year initially and we need to specify that this is a column so we say x is one okay now we will do this same function for all the columns that we don't need so we have certificate i'm just gonna copy paste the name we also have the duration for the descriptions and the stars. Okay, so this is this was the year. Now the certificate is done. Now the duration. I'm not interested in the duration in my calculations. I'm also not interested in the description. And I'm not interested in the stars. Now this information could be useful if we are creating a personalized uh, recommender system but right now we are not doing that okay so this is how we clean this now let us take a look and see what's going to happen if i run this and here i'm going to say clean data set now let's run this we have a key error uh Okay, sorry, there was a problem here. Let me recompile. Okay, let's try again now. One, and let's try to clean the data. Good, now let's display it. It will take some time. And here we go. Now, my data is actually clean. We have the votes, rating, genre, and the title. This is all I need in order to start doing my calculations. Now, I still need to fill in the NANs. Remember the NANs, the empty entries? Well, I'm going to need to fill them. What is the best way to fill the NANs? Now, let us take an entry that is NAN. For example, the 3000. Let me write it down just as a comment so that I don't forget it. It is the 3174. I'm going to be filling this with zeros. Okay? There is a very simple way to do that. All you need to do is to actually say df because we're going to update df df is equal to df dot fill an a with zero so this function is going to search for any nands it's called fill an a and then it will replace it with whatever value you're giving here in my case zero so let me 
we run this cell and I'm going to rerun this one more time and I'm going to display one more time. Now remember, we're going to check if it works or not by checking this entry. 3174 and as we can see, instead of nans, now we have zeros. Well, that's good. Now, as I said, those numbers right here are actually strings and we need a way to grab them actually and well transfer them into an integer or a float whatever we find suitable okay how can we do that now i'm gonna try something here if i say what is the type i want to check the type so that we can both make sure that this is a string right so what is the type of df votes? Okay, let's say entry zero. Okay, let me cut this and put it in a new cell and run it. You'll see that it's a string. So I'm saying, hey, what is the type of votes entry zero? And I'm getting that it is actually a string. We need it to be an integer. Well, we cannot actually convert it directly to an integer for a very specific reason that we have commas these commas are going to make our job a little bit hard i mean usually if we have a string that is a number like that let's say 122 or 5122 and we just convert it to an integer by casting so let me show you an example let's say i want to convert this to an integer it won't work so i'm going to say integer and convert this entry to an integer if i run it uh, let me try again. If I run it, you'll see that invalid literal for integer with base 10 because we have a comma right here. We cannot convert it. But let's say if I try to convert a string of 5 to 0, so this is a 5 to 0 string, if I try to convert it, it will be converted to an integer. So the reason I cannot convert it directly is this comma right here. I cannot really cast it to an integer directly. Solution is by removing this comma from the number and then casting it into an integer. Let me show you how we can do that. Well, we are going to say df votes because I want to modify only the votes is equal to df again vote dot str replace dot replace. And what do we want to replace? I want to, not tr, str. I want to replace the comma with nothing. So whenever I see comma, I want to delete it and just put nothing instead of it. Okay? So, a parenthesis, a comma will be replaced with an empty parenthesis. Okay? So this will make this number as a whole. It will attach it to each other, the 970, let's say, and the 060. Okay, it will be a one number. Now we need to cast it. So I'm going to say dot as type. Let's cast it to a float. Okay. Now, if I run this, run this one more time. And if I display, it will take a minute. Those now, as you can see, are without commas. So we have them as numbers, and that's really great. I mean, here we could have converted it to an integer, but it really doesn't matter. So as you can see, now we have numbers instead of strings. And what we've done here is we've taken votes. We said we want to modify votes. And we've taken all the votes, all the column. And we said all the strings that are in there, all of them are strings. I want to replace the comma that we have with nothing and then cast that number that we are converting into a float. See, pattern is really powerful in scripting. Okay, right now we are done with the pre-processing and we are ready to move to the next step. Okay, so now what is the next step? I want to create a function that will filter my data set into a certain genre. Remember that the goal is to take a certain genre and get the most popular 10, 20, or 30, let's say, series and just display them. So 
the first step is that I need to eliminate all the data that is not necessary. Let's say I would like to have the comedy genre or maybe the drama genre. And well, I want to remove everything else when I am doing my calculation. So here I'm going to say define filter genre. This is my function. Like that. Okay. Now, how can we do this? Now, as we can see here, every title has multiple genres because it makes sense that some titles are a mix of genres, right? So when I am searching, let's say, for drama, I would like to catch the drama keyword in any of the titles, okay, and remove any title that does not have a drama keyword in it, in the genre. There is a very simple way to do this filter with pandas. It's going to take a whole column and search if there is a certain string in that column, okay? How can we do this? Well, first we need to say global df so that we can modify the data frame we have. Next, we need to say df is equal to df. And let's open a parenthesis. We will say df genre. So I'm going to be looking into the keywords in the genre. And I'm going to say dot str dot contains a certain genre, which I will be passing here. Okay, so I'm taking the whole column, this whole genre column, check the string of each of them if it contains a certain genre, which I will be passing to my function. So into my function, I will be passing keywords like comedy, drama. I will filter to whatever keywords I need. And I don't want this to be case sensitive. So case is equal to false. So let's say if I pass it comedy uh, like this, or I pass it comedy like this, it won't make a difference, right? So it's really important to have case equals false in case that I have an issue or maybe my capitalization is wrong. This is all I need to do. Let us test it out. Let's say here that I want to filter for drama. So I'm going to say filter genre for drama, okay? Let's compile the first function here. And now with this one, we got an error. Yes, some of the genres can be zero. Okay, so this is what it's saying here that we are having some nands. Well, how can we resolve this? We can simply go here and just say dot fill and a false okay this will take care of all the nands that we have so let us compile again and here we go we have no errors anymore now let's display and as you can see right now all the titles have only drama 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 there is nothing without a drama and if you take a look at the indexes, you will see that they are not in sequence anymore. We will be taking care of this sequence later, so there is no problem. But the important thing is we filter for drama. Now, let's try to filter for maybe crime. Okay. So, rerun, 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 and display. You'll see that now all the titles have crime. All of them. Okay. So this is how we filter out a certain keyword from a certain column. This is also a very important technique. Now we have filtered it out. And we also took care of the NAs that we might face in that certain column. So far, so good. All right. Right now, we are going to talk about one title. We said that not all the movie's titles will be entitled in our calculation. We said that only series or movies at a certain votes threshold will be accepted. So how can we determine this threshold? 
In statistics, there is something called percentile, or we can call it quantile. A percentile is just a part of quantile, but it is limited to between 0 and 100. A quantile is going to take all the votes concentration at 95%. So we will see at a certain percentage. So let's say I want the concentration at 80%. Okay, I'm going to see where most of the 80% of the votes are concentrated. And then I'm going to cut everything that is behind this 80% percentile. So how can we do that? Well, we need to import NumPy first. So you need to say import NumPy as MB. It's important because we are going to use a method in NumPy that is called quantile. We will define a function. I'm going to call it trash votes. OK, and I'm going to pass it a threshold. So let's say I want to find the concentration of votes at 80% percentile or quantile. OK, how can we do that? First, we need to define the global DF as usual. And let's define a variable Q for quantile. And let's apply that NumPy method. It's called mp.quantile. And where do we want to apply it? Well, we would like to apply it to the votes, right? Apply it on votes. And what is the percentile or the quantile I'm requiring here? It is the threshold. I will pass to it. Okay. Now let's print this queue just to test it out. Now, if we go here and just type trash votes and I say 8%, if I run this, Uh, first, I need to compile this and rerun. We will see that we got a NAN. Why is that? Well, the reason is in our clean data. It did not work as expected. And I wanted to show you this case, actually. Since we are filling the NAs with zero, then we are replacing the comma with nothing. We are getting some NA entries or non-valid entries when we are doing this operation. This is why it's better that we always do the replacement of NAN with zeros at the end of the cleaning of the data set. At least in our case, it's best to do that. So I just switched the order of these two lines. Okay, now let me recompile again and rerun this. And here we go. We got a threshold of 17,000. 82. So any title that has votes less than 70,082 will not be considered. Okay, what I'm going to do now is actually to drop all entries that has votes less than 17,082. We can do that simply by saying df is equal to df.drop. Let's open a parenthesis. And let's type df, open a bracket, and say df dot votes less than m, and then pass it index. Now, the df is going to search for all the votes that are less than that threshold. Okay? Once it finds it, it will get its index, and it will drop it. This is the reason I'm putting all of this condition inside a DF bracket so that I can apply the index method to it because this will return the entry I have, it will get its index, and then I will drop it. Okay, so this is the syntax we are going to use. Now let us try it. Compile this one and compile this one. Uh, sorry, I said here M, it should be Q. Okay. Compile this one, compile this one, and display. As you can see now, I have no entry that has votes less than 17,082. We have filtered it out. And now we are ready to start calculating the weighted average score for every movie. Let's do that now. Now it's time to calculate the weighted average. We are going to define a function that is called weighted average score. And here we go. 
First, we need the global variable, which is the df, as usual. And let us remember the formula. We said that we need the average of the movie, which is the rating we have. So we already have this information. Number of votes, we already have this information as well. Minimum votes required, we also have this. But we still need the mean of all the ratings. So we need to get the mean of all of those ratings we have right here. So this is the first thing we are going to calculate. How can we calculate the mean? Well, it's very simple, actually. Pandas provides us with a way to calculate the mean of a certain column. The same way that we can sum a certain column, as we have learned, we can also calculate the mean. We will simply say mean is equal to df, what, which mean do we want to calculate? The mean of the ratings, right? So we'll just say rating dot mean. Okay, that's it. We can simply try this by just printing the mean right here. And I'm going to say here weighted average score. Let me compile this one and compile this one. And this is the mean for all my data. So far, so good. Now we got the mean. What should we do right now? Well, as you can see, before we can perform calculations, I would like to sort out this problem in the indexing. Remember that when we delete entries, we will be needing to restore the correct indexing. Well, let's do that in the weighted average score. It's actually very simple. All we need to do is just say df is equal to df dot reset underscore index and we need to say drop is equal to true. Okay. Now if I compile this one and compile this one and let us redisplay everything, you'll see that the indexing is corrected. Okay, now we can perform further calculations. Now, what I want to do is I want to create a new column right here, which will be my weighted score, right? Because right now I only have ratings and votes and I want to calculate the weighted score. But where will I store it? Well, I'm going to store it in a column right here. To do that, first I'm going to create an empty list. I'm going to call it weighted average and it's just an empty list which will be serving the purpose of a column now we need to calculate the weighted average for every movie entry so what we need to do is to iterate over all the movies we're going to say for i in range from zero to the length of any column we need let's say for the length of the rating column. So the length of DF rating. Okay. I will be iterating over every single entry I have. Now, what do I want to do? I'm going to create a variable called result and I'm going to apply the formula. Remember this formula right here? Number of votes divided by number of votes plus the minimum. A number of votes multiplied by the average movie plus minimum votes over number of votes plus minimum votes all multiplied by the mean of all the rating. I want to just apply this formula. So first we need the number of votes. I'm going to say df votes i. Right. So I'm getting to the first movie going to its votes and taking it out. So this is the number of votes. I'm going to put this in a parenthesis like this. This will be divided by, open a parenthesis, number of votes, i, plus. Now, we need here plus the minimum number of votes. So why don't we create a minimum number of votes variable? So I'm going to say minimum votes is equal to none and here when we are calculating the number of 
votes instead of q i'm gonna just use the minimum votes so i'm gonna say here minimum votes is equal to this and here i'm gonna say global minimum votes okay so right now minimum votes is a global that this function can access so i'm gonna say here plus minimum votes and this needs to be multiplied by the rating of the movie so we need df rating and we need the rating of that specific movie the index of it and let's close the parentheses here this is the first section of the formula now now we will add to it the minimum number of votes so i'm going to say here min votes divided by open a parenthesis the number of votes so df votes i plus minimum number of votes now all of this needs to be multiplied by the mean okay so this is my formula now after i have calculated the formula i would like to append it to this weighted average right so i got the first entry I calculated the weighted average of it. Now I'm going to append it to this weighted average list. So I'm going to say weighted average dot append result. So right now I'm calculating this, adding a column, and I'm going to be putting its result here, calculating this, putting its result here. We are not really appending it to the table yet, but we are preparing this by creating this list. Okay. Finally, let's append this to the table we have. We can simply say df and create a new entry. I'm going to say weighted average is going to equal to this weighted average. Okay, by that we have created a new column. We need to test this out, right? So let's do this. We have a problem that Q is not defined. This is not Q anymore, actually. This is the minimum votes, that's correct. Now let me try again. And we're good, now let's display. Here we go. As you can see now, we have a new column called the weighted average, and it is calculating the weighted average for that certain movie. As you can see, sometimes the result is close, but sometimes it's not, because the weighted average has, let's say, weighted down this movie or this series from 8.5 to 7.9, actually. This is why weighted average is a way more accurate indication of the rating of the movie because it takes votes into consideration now we are not done yet we need to now implement the function that will sort the top let's say 50 20 or whatever movie or series for a certain category let's see how we can do that okay right now we are going to implement our final function which will choose the top 5, 10, or any number of movies or series and just display them to us. I'm going to create a function. I'm going to call it sort n scores. And I'm going to pass it a number n of my choice. Okay. I'm going to say sort is equal to df.sort underscore values, which is the sorting function for pandas. I'm going to pass which column do I want to sort? Well, it is the weighted average, right? This is the column I'm interested in. And I need to sort this by a descending order. So I need to pass ascending is equal to false. So because I want to sort these top to bottom, right? And then I'm going to pass head n. It means that after I sort these, I only need 10, 20, or whatever number I am passing here. Okay? And this will be my new DF. So 
let's just call it df instead of sort. That would be better. So this will be my latest sort, okay? I'm not gonna write df here because I don't want to overwrite the original uh, data set. I would like only to show the sorted data for that certain small set. So here I'm gonna just call it sort and I'm gonna display whatever I am sorting, okay? Now this program is ready. All I need to do now is just call here sort and scores and just show me the top 10 for crime. So I'm gonna compile this and we don't need this anymore. So I'm gonna just compile this. Here we go. For crime, this is the order that we've got. Breaking Bad is the first, but as we can see, we have noticed now that there is duplications in my data set. Well, that's not really good because we need to delete any duplication that we have. We're going to solve this in a minute. But for now, let's see different categories if it's working or not. Let's say that I want to sort thriller category. And here we go. We got the thriller category, the top 10 of them. Let's say I want the top five only. I only got the top five. This is really great. Now I can have a large set of movies and series and just pick up the top five or 10 and just put them as a recommender system that, hey, if you are watching comedy, those are the best five that you must watch. This is a general recommendation system. Okay. Now we only need to solve these duplications. So let's get to the final step which is the problem we have noticed with the duplicates. We will go to the clean data set and before we start replacing the strings in order to convert them to numbers, there is a method that is called drop duplicates. See, pandas is really great. It has literally everything. I'm just gonna say df dot drop underscore duplicate. And then we need to pass the subset, and in this case, it is the column. So the subset here is actually the title, right? I wanna search all the titles and see if there is a duplicate title and I just wanna remove it. Okay, so now let me run this again, on this one more time. As you can see, no more duplicates. That's great. Now you can simply pick a category and run this program. That's amazing. Now, how about we create a function that will run all of those together? So I'm just gonna say def, let's call it to run recommender system, okay. I'm gonna pass it the category or the genre and the votes thresholds. And finally, number of returned data, okay? And we can simply just take all of those, put them here. Now we have only one function to run all of those functions. We are encapsulating all of these functions with one function. Now the genre need to be replaced by here. Both thresholds need to be replaced by here. And the numbers of returns data need to be replaced right here. And now I need just to call one function. Right here. Genre is going to be, let's say, drama. What's the threshold is 0 0.8. And I just want to return the top 20. If I run this, oh, we need to run the first cell. Then we need to run this. And here we go. We have a very simple function that has all of these underneath it, and it is serving as a simple recommender system. I really hope that you have enjoyed this project. Let us work a little bit on improving this program. Let's take the functions one by one and see what can we improve about it. 
let's start with the read file. Well, the rules that need to be in mind that a class, when we pass parameters to it, it needs to be generic. So a class should not really be dependent on a certain data set. So we would like to actually just send any certain data set of movies or series and be able to calculate those and do those calculations. Well, does our class support that? Not necessarily, because this class is still hardwired to our data set. Why? Because we have those names, the column names, right? Those column names are related only to our data set. Maybe when we look at another data set, let's say we downloaded it from Kaggle, we would see that rating could be called the scores, or maybe votes is called total votes, right? It's not necessarily votes. So how can we make this generic? That is one point to have in mind. Next, we can also improve the drop function right here, the cleaning data set. Maybe another data set would have other columns that need to be dropped. So maybe those columns don't even exist in that new data set. That's why we need a method or a mechanism to tell the class what do we want to drop exactly without hardwiring them like that. This is called hardwiring because it's 100% dependent on a certain data set. We can also create a for loop right here instead of just dropping them one by one like that. This is not really practical. Okay, what else can we do? Well, let's do those improvements that we have talked about. First off, let us start with uh, what can we drop, like the cleaning data set. Let's create a list that contains keywords for the columns that need to be dropped. And this list can be initialized. And this list would have a default values, which is for our data set, and they can be overridden. So we can actually send it our own keywords for columns that need to be dropped. Sounds good. We can just simply say here, best five comedy dot columns to be dropped is equal to this list, and it will replace all of those. Let's try doing that. I'm gonna create a list here, self dot columns drop. Okay, and it's a list, and I'm gonna put those values as default value. Okay, but we are giving the option to override those columns and choose columns of our own. There's a description here. Oh, we still have the stores. Okay. Now, let's change the whole mechanism here and use a for loop. We're going to say for items in self.columns. And we are going to say the following self.df is equal to self.df.drop. I'm just copying the same syntax here. Open a parenthesis. And here we are going to pass item, not items. Let's just make it item. Okay. And also access one. This should do it, right? So we can remove all of those right now. And let's try to run the program to see if we get the same output. Let's run it. Compile this one. See? No problem. We got the same output, so the program did not break, actually. That's good. Now, let's say that you have a new data set and you would like to change those. All you need to do is just come here and say best 5 comedy is equal to no, dot, what is the name of my variable? It's called column drop. I'm going to copy all of this. I'm just going to pass the same ones we have so that the program does not break. Okay, we are now updating this column drop before running. Now, if I simply just run this, the program will run. This was updated. Now, let's give a keyword that does not exist. Now, this should break. As you can see, it broke. 
because no, there is no ease. Okay. All right. Let's run it again, and we're good. So we have improved the cleaning data set. Now we are still hardwired, as I said, to the column's name. So let us make it flexible. I'm going to create a new variable, call it self dot column dictionary. Okay. Or column title is equal to and we are going to create a dictionary here for all of my columns names now those columns names are fixed now for me we're going to call them votes general rating but we have also the option to change them so votes the default value to it is votes we can simply go here, override this dictionary, and change this maybe to scores. So instead of votes, now the keywords is scores. But to me, I just want to leave it as votes now, as a default value. Same thing here for the genre. So this is a genre. Default keyword currently is just genre. Now let's continue. We also have rating, and that's it, right? Yes, we only have rating. And title, sorry. So we have title is equal to title. And we have also rating is equal to rating. Okay. Now, all we need to do is just change this vote here to this. Okay. So we'll say here, for example, let us try changing the program. Uh, here we have title. And what if it is called movie name, right? Like maybe the data set has instead of title column, a movie name column. So I'm going to just say here self.column title, title. So what will happen here is when we want to check the title column name, we will go here, it will go to title and see what we have here if it's called maybe movie name it will just put movie name instead of title okay this makes our program way more flexible now let's copy this and change the whole program we have the votes so here this will be votes name here Will be votes. Okay, let us run this to see if the cleaning data is still working as expected or we have any errors. Still working as expected. Okay, now let's go to filter genre. Same thing here. Just change this to genre. Okay, and votes as well. Just change this to vote. Let's try again to see if we have broken anything. We did not break anything yet. That's good. Now we have threshold, weighted average. We need the rating right now. So let's add the rating. We also have one here. Rating. Now we have one here for votes. Another one here for votes. And here we have a rating. And we have another rating right here. Okay. Sounds good. Let's see if we have broken anything. We are still running as usual. Now, again, if you want to change this, all you need to do is to just copy this. Let's come here and say, hey, my column name has changed. So best five comedy right now dot column title should equal to this dictionary. You need to update the whole dictionary or you can just update individual entries. So run this we have no issue so now we are flexible regarding what we want to drop and what 
titles and what column names we have okay so is our class totally independent of the data set well i guess so because we have a separate data path for every file column drops column titles we are, can read any file we want we can clean with the same way any data we have now here is something that might be an issue which is this right here what if if they already numbers what if the fields are not strings so we can check the type of the vote to see if it's string we can check only one entry if at least one entry is a string we shall continue okay so i'm gonna say here if self.tf votes let's say zero say if the type right here is equal to string then i would like to do this okay let's see if the program will run or it will break it did run as expected all right we're good so now we have considered also this case filter genre is good as well all right so by that we have improved our simple class and we have learned how we can convert a regular function based program into a little bit of an object oriented programming program what i want to talk about right now is the object character recognition which is called ocr now i'm gonna summarize what is ocr in this image OCR is the process of taking an image that contains text and being able to extract that text and convert it to a strings that we can use and manipulate, okay? And convert it to strings that your Python can read. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that this is an invoice that you have scanned using your scanner and now it's on your computer. Now there is no way that you'll be able to copy any of the text that is around this piece of paper right because well it's a jpeg image or it could be a png image and you cannot really choose you cannot really select text and copy it in images right if this was a word document or an excel document maybe you will be able to just copy this text otherwise when it's an image this is not possible and this is what ocr does this is the great thing about it it provides you with algorithms that will help you recognize where is the text and convert it to a string that you can read in your Python script maybe. There is tons of applications for OCR and one of them is automating accounting daily tasks. Let's say that you have a database. Let's say that you have multiple invoices that you would like to scan and then maybe uh, block those information into some accounting database. You can automate the whole process by just passing out every single invoice that the Python script could actually just get the text from there and it can be linked to the database and it will be modifying the database based on the information and it can enter the data from the invoice into the database automatically without you doing anything. So there is a lot of applications that we can use OCR for. And now we will be getting started with this great technology using Python. In order to start with OCR, we need to download few things. The most important thing is actually the Tesseract library. Now, Tesseract is the library that we will be using in all of our OCR conversion tasks so you need to log into this page right here and i would like you to download the 64 version or the 32 bit version depending on your windows version okay so just download any of them and i need you to copy this downloaded exe and put it in your folder in your project folder okay 
So let's say you have downloaded this. Now, after you download it, you need to install it. Now, after installation, you need to get the path that you have installed it in. So, in my case, it is installed right here. And you need to copy this path and put it aside because we're going to need it when we, when we start writing our OCR program. Okay? So, the full path you're going to need should look something like that. Maybe you installed it in D or in anywhere else. You just need to modify it to get the full path with this Tesseract EXE. Okay, this is the first step. Next step, we need to install BDF to image. Now, BDF to image is actually a library that allows you to read BDF pages and convert them to images, which then can be passed to Tesseract in order for the text to be extracted. Okay, because, well, most of the invoices maybe are in BDFs, and, well, a BDF is not an image. It needs to be converted to an image to be processed further. And you also need this popular supporting library, which is important for BDF to image. Okay, so what I need you to do is open Anaconda prompt and just copy these commands here. We have this one. You need to launch this one. And then you execute it. Then you have this one. You also need to execute it. And that's it. After you install these two libraries, you will be ready to start programming some OCR scripts. Let us right now talk about our new project. Okay, we have made it so far and learned a lot about pandas and data processing. But now let us apply it in some real project. Now, this project is going to be categorizing Netflix movies based on their genre and picking, let's say, the top 10 movies for every genre. So we will be having a data set, which we will be getting from Kaggle, which we have talked about. And this Kaggle data set contains all the movies, their rating and everything and any information that we might need regarding that certain Netflix movie. So this is really exciting. Let us see how we can proceed with that. Before starting the project, we need to establish the concept of weighted average. So far, we already know how we can take an average, right? But weighted average actually relies on more information than, let's say, the score. Okay? Let us say that we have movie number one and this movie has an imbd which is the most famous rating system on the internet and let's say that the movie number one has the rating of maybe 6.4 and let us say that around 6,000 people voted for that okay so let's talk about movie number two this one has an IMBD, let's say, of 9.0, but only five people voted for that. Okay? Does it make sense that this movie is actually better than this movie? Well, it does not really make sense because here I have only five votes and here I have 6,000 votes. So the number of votes should be considered when we are rating the movie. This is where it comes the weighted average now this one has a formula which we will learn let us give the following symbols their meaning so we have r is the average of the movie okay which is this number here let's say v is equal to the number of votes we have for that certain movie and m is the minimum votes required to be even included in this system, right? Because let's say a movie has only five votes, I really don't want to include it in my calculation right here because it does not really have enough votes to be considered. So M is the minimum votes required. And finally, let's say that C is actually the mean of all the ratings of all the movies. 
Okay? And now we can write our formula. So, the formula is going to look like this. Let me divide this page. And we are going to say the weighted average is going to equal to V divided by V plus M all multiplied by R plus, okay, we are going to continue right here, M divided by V plus M all multiplied by C. Okay, so this is my formula which I will apply in order to get a weighted average for every single movie, considering the number of votes as well. Okay, this is the most important formula in this whole project. Once we apply it to our data set, we can get the correct rating. Okay, now let us talk more about what does this project contain. What is the first step I want to do? I want to be able to read my data set. Okay. After I have read this data set, I want to clean it. There would be some columns that maybe are not necessary. Maybe some of the formatting of the cells, of the Excel cells or the CSV cells is not correct. Meaning that maybe when I try to read a number, it would be a string instead of a number. And this happens a lot actually in data sets. You would see a column that is full of numbers, but once you read it, you'll realize that it is a string and you need to convert it to an integer maybe or a float, right? So this is a cleaning and pre-processing. This is a very important step. Next, I want to select the genre. Remember that my project is about selecting every genre and then picking up maybe the first the 20, 30, 50 movies in that genre. So what we need here is filter genre. Number three, we need a way to threshold the minimum number of votes. I mean, we need to determine minimum number of votes. How can we do that? We will see a method in order to pick up a certain percentile of the votes in, in all the movies and then considering this as a minimum threshold, okay? So we'll see where is the most votes concentrated, okay? And then we are going to eliminate a portion of them. We'll see how we can do that when we start implementing. We also need a function to calculate the weight average, right? The weighted average need to be calculated. And also, finally, we need a sorting function. To sort the movies from highest to lowest or from lowest to highest. Okay, so we need to be sorting those data at the end. So it's a really exciting project, a small one. This is a very small recommender system and recommender systems have way more into it and there is tons of algorithms that can be used for personalized recommender systems. For example, those that we can see on Netflix sometimes when it is recommending similar movies to the ones that you have watched already. But for now, we want to be able to just pick up a data set and pick that best certain number of movies and pick the top certain number of movies in every genre. Let us start implementing this. What I want to talk about right now is how can we convert a PDF into an image? So we have already install the bdf2 image library and let's see how we can do that okay let's say that i have this bdf file and this is the same invoice i used before in and extracted information from but this time it is in bdf format now the steps in order to extract any of this text information is to first convert it to an image then extract the information as we have learned before so we are missing one step let's see how we can add this step and just to know this is only a one page PDF. Okay, let's add to the program we wrote in the previous tutorial. So let's say from PDF to image import convert underscore from underscore path. Okay, now we can simply do the following I'm gonna say image is equal to convert underscore from underscore path 
and all I need to do is just to pass the BDF path. So this is my BDF path, and it's called invoice one. So this is invoice one dot BDF. Okay. Now this function here will return a list because this BDF could have been multiple pages and it will return every page as a single image. This is why the return value here is a list. But since I'm working with only one page, I could do the following. I could say image is equal only to image zero. Okay. Now image zero is actually an image, single one. And image here is a list. So I'm replacing this list with only a single image. Okay. Now let's remove this image read right here and try to work on the converted image from BDF. Okay. So right here, we are just setting the path. Let's set the path here at the beginning. It really doesn't matter, but let's just organize it a bit. We are converting from BDF to an image. Then we are extracting using the Tesseract library. And then we are printing whatever we extracted. Let's run it. And here we go. We got the same result as before, but with only an additional step of converting a BDF to an image. Okay. Now, if you have two pages, you could just maybe assign this to be the second page or the third page, or you can create a for loop to convert every single page that is existing in image. Okay. And now we are ready to start writing our program. We are going to leave this information as it is, the library import and the and our py tesseract. Okay. I am going to create a dictionary that contains the coordinates for the information that I need. Initially, the information I need are the product description, the unit price, and the amount. Let's not care a lot about the total price for now. We can actually calculate it using unit price and amount. So to reduce the information extracted, we will be focusing on description, unit price, and amount. So let's create a dictionary that will hold the coordinates for this information. First, we're going to say here a key called product. And it will have the coordinates, the base coordinates for the product. Okay, we're going to fill those in a minute. But for now, let's just prepare the dictionary. I'm going to call this dictionary chord for coordinates. Okay, let me continue. Next, we have the quantity. So we have amount, let's call it. We need a comma here, let's add a comma here. And finally, we need the price. Okay, now let's get the coordinates for the product. Let's take a look here at this point. If you take a look at the coordinates, at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see that it is 90. And let's make it 790 as well. Okay. It's better to take the box from the upper line. So we will take the box starting here. So it is 90 and 790. All right. Now, what is the length that we need here? Well, let's measure it. Let me remove all of those. Now, let me take a length that will cover some large area. Let us create a box that is with this width around 790, okay? And we will see that the width is around 790, the whole width, and the base coordinate, as we said, are 90 and 790. So this is the first point around here. Almost, it's fine with, if we have a problem with a few pixels. So this is the base point, it is 9790. And the width is, it's around 700 in our case, right? Because if we subtract 90 from the total length, which is 790, we would get 700. So our width is 700. And the height we have here from 790, let's say to 38, 838. So we have around 48, I guess, as a height. Okay, so let's log in those information. So we have 90, 790. Then we have the width and the height. And the width is around 700, and the height is 48. Okay, so here we have x, y, width, and height. Now let's check the amount. Now let's take the amount from 100 
1250 790 is the initial point let's say until this point it's fine let's take it until here okay so we took a width of around 200 1250 2450 okay and the height will be the same as here right so let's go plug in that information we have 90 we have 1250 790 is the initial point then we had a width of 200 and we would be keeping the same height of 48 okay now the price let's take the price from here let's take it at 1480 and y is 790 and let's extend it let's say to here okay so approximately now our width is around 140 right if we calculate it so let us plug in that information as well and and the height is as usual it's the same as the previous cells so this is 1480 790 140 and of course 48 okay now we have the base coordinate let us create another dictionary that will store the information that we have read so we have data dictionary is equal to well remember i am cropping every single cell i have here and i am storing it right so i want to know exactly where i am storing this what is the name of the file i am storing it as i will be cropping this and saving it as a separate image every box will be a separate image but i need information like what is written inside this box and where is the image exactly okay so to know where is the image i will create a list inside this dictionary that will store all the paths for all the images so i'm going to say product name path this is for the product name the description of the product okay next we have the product quantity right and next i will have the product income i need to add path here and path here okay so this will be only the path of the image and the image name all right nothing complicated here now let us also add what is the name inside that box so i'm going to say product name we will be storing this later whenever we read through ocr then we have product quantity and finally product income so this is like a small database that will hold all the information i need right so and the indexes will match because so right now the indexes will match as well because let's say that i have five product names five images stored and their paths are stored here now the text inside every image will be stored here as well and i will be having also five of them so index zero here will correspond to index zero here one here one here so this is like a database with matched indexes okay so it's easy to access any information we need using this small database okay i need to create also two small variables which is the image i am reading it will be initialized to none and the data frame remember data frames we've talked about that intensively it will be initially none okay now let us talk more about the data that this function will return so i'm gonna comment out the string image to string right here and we're going to work with image to data okay so first we are reading the image and then we are extracting data from that image let's take a look at this dictionary one more time so i'm going to be printing data dot keys and let's watch those keys it should be keys here we go right now i am interested in having bounding boxes around every word that was read that would be really helpful to know where is the location of every text for example let's say that i am interested in 
taking out the name of this company, okay, or maybe the invoice number. When I read all of this all at once, I might be reading the invoice number, but how would I know where it is in this whole text that I just read, right? I need a way to locate where it is, and the easiest way to do that is using bounding boxes. So, with this image to data, it will return the coordinates of the box that encloses this word, okay? So, if I know the coordinates of this box, it means that I can know that here is my invoice, right? Like, let's say this is the, the same thing for maybe the company name. There will be an enclosing box around the company name. I know its coordinate. So all I need to do is to search for those coordinates in order to get maybe the company name, okay? So let's see how we can work with the bounding boxes. As you can see here, the left, top, width, and height are the parameters we will be using in order to draw the bounding boxes because we need to draw them based on this information here. Now the bounding boxes will be coming from this OpenCV library here. Now, if I try to print here data, maybe left, okay? Let's see what we will get. As you can see, this is the left coordinate of that bounding box we are talking about for every word that we have read, okay? So if we take a look here, this area right here is the left top coordinate. It has an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. Okay, and then we have the width is the width of this box and we have the height. So this information should be enough for us to draw the bounding boxes. Let's take a look. We are going to iterate over them. So I'm going to be saying for i in range, let's say from zero to the length of, uh, let's say left. So we are saying data left. So we want to sweep all the coordinates, okay? You can choose any attribute for this len because the len is equal for all the attributes. Okay, now I'm gonna do a quick assignment like x, y, w, h are going to equal to respectively data left, i, okay? So the x is the data left, the top will be the y, see, they are corresponding to each other, then we have the w, and the w is the width, so this will be my width, and finally I have my height, and this is my height, okay? Now it's time to draw this rectangle. We are going to use OpenCV for that, so we are going to say image is equal to cv2 dot rectangle and then we are going to pass the parameters the first one is the image we want to draw on so we will be drawing on the image we have read then we need to pass the x and the y for that as a tuple so we need to open a parenthesis here then we need to pass x plus w and y plus h comma y plus h in order to define the width and the height based on the xy coordinate, okay? And then we need the color we want to draw. Let's say it is 255, 0, 255. And then we have the width. It's going to be 1, okay? The line width of the box we are drawing. Okay, that's it. Now, let's use OpenCV as well in order to show this image we have created. So I'm going to say cv2. Im show image. I want to show image. Okay. So this is the title of the window that will be shown, and this is what I want to show exactly, which is the image. Then, so that we don't get stuck, we will say cv2 weight p0. Okay. Now let us take a look. Now, as you can see, everything now is in bounding boxes. See that every information is actually bounded by a box and that's really great now we know what is being read exactly let us implement an automation project for OCR 
and also we can practice more on data sheets and spreadsheets. Let's imagine that I have an imaginary inventory. Let's say that I am a company that sells 3D printers, filament for the 3D printers, and resin for the 3D printers. Okay, so filaments and resins are actually the raw material that is used in order to 3D print. Okay, so resin is usually liquid, and a filament is usually a solid plastic. Let's say that I have printers so i sell printers and i sell the base materials and for every item i have how many do i have in my inventory i have what is the base price i am sell i am buying from other vendors and how much i am selling it and how much i made so far from that particular item okay and let's say that i have an invoice that looks like this for a certain purchase and I don't really want to go item by item and update how many quantity do I have after I have sold one of this item. And I don't want to really update my income by hand. I just want to have a script that will read those line by line and then update this spreadsheet or my imaginary inventory accordingly. Okay, so we need multiple skills. We need the OCR skills. We need the spreadsheet bandas library skills. And we are going to mix those two together. Okay, so let me now talk a little bit more about the project that we are going to implement. What kind of functions would we like to write? Of course, we're going to need something to read the invoice, right? So we need to read the invoice. And we will be using the OpenCV library just to read the image. We will be assuming that all the invoices are images. Okay? We can later give an option of reading a PDF invoice, but initially all of them will be images. Okay? Next, we would like to extract the information from that invoice. So we need to extract info. Now, what do I mean by that? We are going to open the invoice using paint it is the easiest program to work with and we are going to label where is the information that we need so in our case we care about the product name the price the amount and the total price and we need that for every single row of this sheet right Maximum, I guess we can fit 17 lines around here. Now, if we count them, we will be getting 17. So we have 17 entry maximum per invoice. What we are going to do is we are going to be cropping this information. Okay, so I'm not going to be passing this whole invoice to my OCR algorithm. No, I'm going to be cropping only the important areas. After that, all I need to do is just getting here, getting the coordinates, and it's very simple to get the coordinate. You just put your cursor here, and you will see down here, take a look here, you'll see the coordinates, okay? And then we need to approximate what is the width and what is the height. It's not really approximation, we just need to calculate it. We'll see how we can do that, it's really simple. Now, we will do this for the unit price and for the amount, and same thing for the total price. We will get the coordinates of all the boxes. Now, it makes no sense to actually get the coordinates for every entry. This is a lot of work. What we can notice is that there is a pattern, meaning that the distance here, the distance for every field is actually the same. So we can get the coordinate of one of them and then just use a for loop to increment accordingly right we can just shift this coordinate by a certain amount let's say by the amount of the height right here and we can just sweep all of our descriptions all of our items we can do the same thing for the unit price we can just shift this box down same thing for amount and for total price okay so this is what i mean when i say i want to extract information I want to crop the images and distort them 
so that I will be passing them to OCR one by one later. Okay? Now inside here, I will be creating some dictionaries which will save the location for a quantity, for a name, for income, for all of this information. Okay? Next, I need an OCR function. This is the actual text extraction. Okay? So I will be passing every image and then I will be extracting the information from it. Now, this is the section related to OCR. Now, there is another section related to my database, right? I need a function to get me the item index, right? So, get item index. Now, what is this exactly? Let's say I extracted this name using OCR and I extracted the text. Now, I want to go to my Excel sheet. And I want to find where is this item, if it exists in the inventory or not. If it does, I want to get its index. Because if once I find its index, I can modify quantity, I can modify base price, sell price, and income, right? So I need a function that will extract this text, search for it in the Excel sheet, and get me where it is located by giving me its index. Next, we need to subtract quantity. What do I mean by that? Let's say that I have read the quantity right here, okay? And I have the index for this item. All I need to do now is convert this amount or quantity to a number, go here and just extract it from the quantity cell. So let's say I am selling this item, quantity is one. So I wanna decrease this by one because we have sold one of them according to the invoice, right? Same thing. We would like to update the income for every item we read. We need to be able to get the quantity in the first place, right? Because in order to subtract the quantity, I need to get the quantity first. And we need to get the income. Okay? Since here I am updating the Income, I'm subtracting the quantity. I need what are the basic quantity and income first. So I need to go here for this particular item, let's say, get what is the quantity and get what is the income. Then I can subtract the invoice quantity from here, as we said, and then we can increment the income from here. Okay. And finally, we need to combine these in one function. We'll say this is like process database. Okay, which will combine these operations together. All right, this is our project. Let's go and start implementing it. Okay, so let's get started and write our first OCR script. What we're going to do is to take this invoice and extract all the text that we see here. Okay, then we will try to link it to uh, some Excel database and maybe create some inventory and subtract those amounts from the inventory. We can do that later. But for now, what I'm gonna focus on is how can we extract all the text and convert it to strings so that we can process it in Python. So let's get started. The first thing we're gonna do is to import Tesseract. I'm gonna say by Tesseract. Okay, next we're going to say from by Tesseract import output. We're going to see where we will be using this. Now we want to point where is the Py Tesseract path. Remember, we have installed Py Tesseract path, and I told you to copy the path because we're going to use it right here. So we are going to say Py Tesseract dot by tesseract dot tesseract underscore cmd is equal to the path we have so this is the path and there is two ways either we put an r right here if we are on windows or we can convert all of those to double slashes so it's up to you right now let's just use an r as an alternative because we have always added double slashes here 
Okay, well, there's one more thing we need OpenCV. So import CV2. Okay, now let's go and read that image that I have showed you. So I'm going to say image is equal to cv2.mread and just put the path of that image. In my case, the path is like this. Okay, now we have read the image. What are we going to do next? Let's try to read the text. Okay, all the text that we have. We are going to say text is equal to by tesseract dot image underscore two underscore string. And then we are going to pass which image do we want to convert. So it is this image. Okay. Finally, we will just print this text. It's really, really simple. Let us run this. We have an extra parenthesis here. Let's run this again. We need to close the quotation here. We forgot that. Let's run this. It's running. And this is all the text. As you can see now, we have extracted everything. Let's compare them. As you can see, this is the company name. This is the invoice. This is the Mr. Hamshu company. This is the address. Everything is copied. This is the invoice of everything that we have bought. In our case, this is like maybe a 3D printing shop that sells resin, filament, and 3D printers. And as we can see, everything is copied. We might be seeing some issues maybe here. If you can see here, the quantity should be one, but it read it as a bracket. We can fix this later. But initially, everything was converted to a text and it was copied. That's good. Now, Tesseract also supports getting more information regarding this text. Now, okay, we have converted this text, but we don't know where is its location, where, where everything is located. And that's not really good because you want to know where is your text located so that you know what you are reading, right? It's not enough to just convert everything to text without knowing more information of what is this text represents. So there is another way which will extract more data for us. We're going to say data is equal to by, is equal to by, disrect. But this time we will be using a method called image to data. So we're going to say image underscore two underscore data. And we will be passing the image. And also we will be passing that output dictionary. Remember here we imported output. So we'll be say output underscore type is equal to output dot dictionary. Okay. We need a T as well. Okay. Now, we will see what is this output dictionary in a second. Now, this will return a whole dictionary. Let's see what are the keys of that dictionary. Print data dot keys. Remember when I told you in the dictionary section that sometimes we have external libraries that have dictionaries and we would like to know what are the keys that they support? What are the keys that are existing in that dictionary? And this is one of those cases. We have a dictionary. This is returning a dictionary. And we would like to read what keys we have returned. So let's run this. I'm going to comment out this print text for a second so that they are not executed. Let's run this. As you can see now, this is all the information that we can get. We can actually get where is the location. Where is the location of the text with those four information right here. We can get the text itself. We can get how many numbers we have read, how many lines, how many blocks, how many pages. See, there is a lot of information regarding that text that we have read. This will be really helpful along the line. We can simply get the same output of the string using the data by doing the following. So right here, if I say print data and then dot text, if I run this, Oh, not dot, sorry, just data text. As you can see now, it returns a list of all the words that it saw. Okay, this also can be helpful in some scenarios. Now, this is really generic, and I just wanted you to get started with OCR. But later, we will be doing more robust applications.
Now we are going to code our OCR function. We're going to say diff OCR, and we will see later what we can pass to it. Okay, so what will the OCR do exactly? It is going to iterate over a certain key. Okay, let's say the name of the product. And remember, here we have the paths of all the images. We are going to iterate over all the paths, load that image, and then apply an OCR. Then this OCR will extract whatever information, like the product name, and then it will store it in the product name list right here. If we are working with quantity, we need to iterate over all the paths of all the quantity that we have stored as images. We will load all the images, we will extract all the quantities, and then store them in this product quantity. Same thing will happen for the income path. That means what we need to pass here is actually the path that we want to load the image and the key. The path being here, whatever we store in here, which we will be extracting them, and the key being, let's say, product name so that we can store what we have extracted from the OCR. Okay? Let's see how we can do that. The first thing we want to do is iterate over that certain path. We're going to say for image path in data dictionary, and we need to pass the path to it, right? This is my data dictionary. I'm passing the path. The path here could be this keyword this keyword or this keyword okay now what are we going to do we are going to read the image so we'll say image is equal to cv2 dot im read what do we want to read exactly the image path because this image path will be extracting all the paths that are stored here and we will be reading them one by one now what happens after we read the image here, I want to emphasize something. Tesseract has multiple modes when you are trying to read an image. There is modes for a single digit image, and there is mode when you want to read a whole multiple data from an image. So it's really important. So the performance would really be different when you are trying to read one digit and a whole sentence. Let me give you an example. If we take a look here, this is a single digit. So we need to configure Tesseract to be reading single digits. It is better because the accuracy will be much higher. And we need to configure it when we are trying to read the whole sentence like that. Okay? So how can we do that? Now we need to notice something. Quantity usually is the only thing which has a single digit. And the name and the income are usually not a single character or a digit, but multiple ones. So what we're going to be using here is if we have a product name, for example, I will be using the configuration of reading multiple characters from an image. How can we do that? Well, I'm going to say if path is equal to product name path, I want to configure this direct in a certain way. How can we configure it? We will say config is equal to Let's open a parenthesis. We have two important configurations. One of them is called OEM, which is which algorithm will be used. Here we are using neural nets when we pass one, and this is like one of the best uh, OCR's algorithms. So we are specifying explicitly that I want to use neural nets. And then there is something called PSM. Now, What's important for me is PSM3 and PSM6. PSM3 is the default, which will read multiple data from the image. PSM6 is for reading a single character. Okay? So, if we have a product name, I just want to leave it as the default. All right? This will be my configuration, PSM3 and OEM1. Now, when the path is equal to quantity or income or whatever, I just want to use a different configuration. I will be using the single uh, digit or a single word mode, which is PSM6. Okay, 
So PSM6 is for single words or single digits. And PSM3 is for reading everything that it sees in an image. There is one more thing. When I am reading a single digit or a single word, it's proven that if we apply some image filters on that image that we are trying to read, the accuracy will also be improved. So I'm going to say here image is equal to cv2 dot Gaussian blur. So I'm going to be applying a blur to that image that I am reading. We will pass image, we will pass the kernel being 5 equals 5, and here we will be passing 0. So we are filtering this image in order to increase the accuracy of the OCR, only for the single digits, because the single digit usually has a low quality, on the contrast of when you having a whole image that is trying to read from. Okay, so what we are going to do next now, after we have configured the OCR algorithm, we can start the OCR. We will say data is equal to by disrect dot image underscore two underscore data things that we have learned before. Then we will be passing the image we are reading, and then the output type is going to be output dot dictionary. And finally, how would disrect know which configuration is being used by passing? the configuration like that. So this is configuration. We are setting it before running this rect, and then we are passing whatever configuration we have chosen. Okay, now let us print maybe the data text. Okay, just for testing. Let me test this now. I'm gonna just run OCR. And let's say we are trying to extract the product name. So we need the path. And we need the key where we are going to store that string name. Okay, let's take a look. Now, if we run this, uh, we need to compile this first. Still having an issue because we said if path should be here equal equal. Again, we're still having some issue in the configuration. We need to add some quotation here, a single quotation. Okay, much better. Now let's try again. We have no issues. Now let me run this. And here we go. This is what we are getting when we are trying to extract the names. So right here, we are extracting actually all of those boxes. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And here we have we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine as well. Okay, we're good. As you can see, we have some issues in this data. One of them is that we are reading the empty boxes. Take a look here. Those are the empty boxes and they are being read. We need to eliminate any empty boxes. Also need to eliminate those empty strings in the names, right? What I want to do when I store this in the product name, I want to have only strings. Like, let's say this list right here. What I would like to store in the name is something like resin printer mag21. Okay, this is what I would like to store. I don't want a list and I don't want any empty strings and I don't want to store any empty entries. So we need some pre processing for those texts. Let's see how we can do this pre-processing. First, let's try to eliminate those empty entries. Eliminating empty entries is very simple. All you need to do is just say if any, then D for data, of course, text, continue. Now, what does this mean? And when you call any and you pass it a list, it is going to return it true if all if any of the entries is a string, okay? So, for example, we have this list right here. Let me copy it. I just want to show you how any works. Now, if I say print any L, I will get true. Why? Because is any of the element is actually a string? Yes, it is. 
Now, let me remove all of those. Take a look. It will return false because is any of those entries is a string? No, there is only empty strings. So it will return false. Okay. What I want to do is whenever I see an empty string like that, I would like to skip and not append it, right? Because I only want to append entries that have a string in them. Whenever I see an entry that does not have a string, I would like to skip and not append it. This is why we use continue. Continue is going to skip this whole loop and start with the next iteration. So if I have more statements here, they will be skipped. And if continue is executed, those will be skipped and we will be starting the new iteration. Okay. So right now, I need to pass not here because I want to negate this, meaning that only if it is empty, I want to skip. If it has anything in it, I don't want to skip. This is why we need to negate this condition according to what we have found here, right? So if I take this print statement and I just put it here, let me execute this. And you'll see that I got rid of all the empty entries that were read from the empty boxes. That's really good. I'm not done yet. Now I want to extract those, okay, and put them in a string before appending them to my product name. Because I want a product name, not a list of separated words. How can we extract words from a list? Let's think about it. Let us use list comprehension to do that. I'm going to say d text is equal to, I would like to extract all of those and omit all of those. This can be easily done with list comprehensions. We have talked about list comprehension before, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to say x for x in d text if x is not equal to an empty string. Okay. Now let's remove this print from here and put it here. So what we are doing here is we are iterating over all the elements and we are only appending the elements that does not equal to empty string. Okay. Now let me run this and run this. Uh, we have a type error. Okay, here we are getting an error because this is not D, this is data. Sorry about that. Now let me try again and let me rerun this. As you can see right now, we got a list of only string entries and we have removed all the empty strings. That is really great. What is left is to strip out all of these words and form a string out of it. Okay. Now, how can we do that? We are going to create a variable called s for a string and it will equal to an empty string dot join d text data text. Okay. We are saying that strip every keyword and join it with an empty space because we will be getting resin printer m821 all without the spaces and we don't want that. We want this to be joined with the spaces. So, right now, if I am to print the string, as you can see, we have extracted all the names. And this is what we want to add to our product name. Okay, so we did some pre processing before we are able to do that. So, the final thing we want to do is just append. We'll say data, dictionary, whatever key we are passing dot append string and now what i would like to print is this data dictionary key let's run this no let us not print it like that let us print it out of the loop when we are done as you can see now in this dictionary i have all the entries as a string. See, this is exactly what we are looking for. Now we are ready to take those and search in our Excel file or database if they exist or not. And then we can do some quantity operation and income operations on them.
Now we are ready to start working on our databases. Let me remind you of how our database looks like. This was our database. It contains item, quantity, base price, sell price, and income. The first thing we would like to do is to actually read this database, right? And we will be using pandas to do that by reading the CSV file. So let's say define a function called get database. Okay. And we will be passing a path to it, which is the path to our database. We need to say global df because we want to write and store the database or the data frame here in this global variable so that all the other functions can actually access it. And we're going to say df is equal to pd.read underscore csv and then the path. Okay, this will help us read the database. What's next? Now, let's say that we are searching for an item which is in the product name right here. How can we search for it? Well, we can simply say define get db item index. We would like to return where is the index of that item, right? What we care about is the index of the item we are searching for. Let's say that the OCR returned this string. I would like to come here, search for this string, and get the index. Now, if I have the index for this item right here, I can access the quantity, best price, sell, sell price, and income because all of them have the same index, right? So, we are going to pass it an entry, which is the name of the item. And we are going to simply return df.index. We would like to get the index of that item. Item equals entry. We need double equal here, that's correct. This is how we search for an index using pandas, right? What's next? How about if we would like to get the quantity? Since we have the index right now, we can get the income, the quantity, we can get whatever we want. Now, let's say that we would like to get the quantity. Well, we can get the quantity simply by defining a function for that. And let's say that we have the index for it then we can simply just return data dictionary quantity data dictionary and we need the product quantity here and the index assuming that we have the index okay now we can do the same thing for the income let us get the income from here so we need the product income right because everything is stored in that data dictionary all we need is the index okay next we will see how we can subtract the quantity and modify the product income from the excel sheet we still need two more functions one of them is to modify the quantity and the other is to modify the income because whenever we read an invoice, we would like to see how many of that item was sold so that we can subtract it from the inventory quantity. And we'd like to see how much income we got from that certain item and update this accordingly. When we are working with quantity and income, we need to read the current income first and then add to it, right? Because let's say we have already sold $50 here and then we sold $30. We would like to copy this 50. We need to get this 50, add 30 to it, and then store it again, right? Same thing for quantity. In quantity, let's say with that we have sold 5. We need to get the 30, subtract 5. We will get 25, and then restore it. So how can we do these operations? We'll define a new function. One of them is called subtract quantity. And this will take, what is the quantity I would like to subtract? And it will, it will take the index. Where is that item that I would like to subtract, right? Then we can do a simple pandas operation. We need to say global df so that whatever we modify to our data frame is actually reflected to the global data frame. And then we would say df quantity, right? Because if we take a look here, it's called the quantity. Index is equal to df quantity index right minus quantity now just to make sure that everything is an integer 
I'm going to convert this to an integer. Because sometimes when we are reading from Excel sheets, sometimes the entries are not integers, but rather strings. So here I make sure that they are integer. And maybe this one as well. Doesn't really matter. Okay, this is all we need for the subtract quantity. Now, how about income? Let's define update income. Okay, we'll do the same thing. We would like to pass income and we would like to pass index. And we will do the same thing. I'm just going to copy all of this, paste it here, and change this to income. Same here. And here I just want to add income. And now we are ready and we have defined all the necessary functions. Now let's integrate all of these functions together with a function called the process database. What should this process database do? This is the meat of our spreadsheet processing. We would like to iterate over all the names that we have here. Okay, this is the first step. We will iterate over all the names, get them, search for them in the spreadsheet, and then get the quantity and subtract the quantity, get the income, and then subtract the income for all the entries that we have in the product name, which we have extracted already from OCR and stored there. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be saying for I item enumerate in enumerate data dictionary product name. Okay, now why did we use enumerate? Because I want the items in product name and I want to keep track of which index I am in at the moment. Okay, this will be important when we are updating the quantity and the income. Let's continue. First, I would like to get the index from my database. Okay, so I want to get the name. Let's say the name in the invoice is this one. I want to get it. And I want the index of this item. How can we do that? Well, we'll say index is equal to the function we have created. Get db item index. What do we need to pass to it? The item. What is the item? Which is the, is the name of the product that is stored here. Okay. So we got the index, meaning we have the index here. Now, let's continue. Since we have the index, we can go to the quantity right now. Get the quantity from the database. Get the quantity from my dictionary, which is the data dictionary that we have and then subtract it from whatever we have here, right? So we are going to say subtract quantity and we are going to pass it get quantity of i and the index. What am I doing here? This is not get, this is get. Okay, what are we doing here? Look, we got the index from the spreadsheet, which is index, let's say, 2. It's 1, actually, but let's assume that it is 2. Okay? We got index 2. Now I am passing it right here to my subtract quantity. Where is my subtract quantity? Here it is. Subtract quantity requires the index in my database, meaning in my Excel sheet, and it requires what is the actual quantity, right? But what is the quantity? The quantity is something we have read through OCR and stored here, right? When we were using OCR, we have read this box and we have stored it as the quantity. Is that correct? And it is stored here with the same index as the product it is having, okay? So right now I'm saying get the quantity i. I is the first entry stored in the data dictionary, and I'm saying get that quantity. This is the get quantity function. It goes to the data dictionary. Sorry, uh, we forgot to call this income. Okay, yeah. Now, the quantity here, we are jumping to this. We are accessing the data dictionary and accessing the product quantity and accessing the index. And the index is 
the product name index, right? Because here we have three indexes. You need to be careful. We have the index here, and which is in the spreadsheet. And then we have the indexes, which are stored in here, which corresponds to these. This is index 0, this is index 1, 2, 3, 4. Those indexes are related to the invoice, and those indexes are related to the database. Okay? This is why we have two indexes here. All right, so we are subtracting the quantity. We will do the same for the income. We will say update income get income. We will pass it i as well, and we will pass it the index. And this should do it. Now let's compile this, and we're good. Now, what's left is to test this scenario. Now we are at the final stages of this project. What is left is to continue and finalize the project. The OCR here already extracted the name. Now we need the OCR to extract the quantity and the price as well. Okay. So here we're going to say uh, this is the quantity. Here as well we have a product quantity. And finally we have the price which is called income path and product income. So here we have income and here we have income. Okay. Now this will extract all of our OCR boxes for all the fields that we need. Now we can call get DB. We will say get database and I'm going to pass it the path of my CSV file. And then we have the process DB. We need to process our database. We just run it. And well, we can now just save the CSV file one more time, right? So we're going to say df.2 CSV file or to CSV and just let us not replace the original. We can actually replace the original, but for me, I just want it to be separated. I don't want the original to be modified because. I need it for further processing. Okay, now let me compile the first one and let me compile the second one. Let's see if we have any issues. We are still running, running. We have a name error, PD is not defined. Okay, yes, because we did not import pandas. Let's import pandas as PD. Let me run this one more time. Let's see if we have any more issues. So we have a key error item. Okay. It's saying that this item is wrong. Let's say, take a look and see why. That's because item here is a capital letter and we are using a small letter. Okay. Let's try one more time. Let me run this and run this. Let's hope we don't have any more errors. Subtract quantity is not defined. Maybe we typed it wrong, so we have a typo. Let's see now, run it again. And we are good. As you can see here, we extracted the names, we extracted all the amounts and the prices. Now, if we go and open that file, this is my out file. And as you can see, the items were updated. This is the old one and this is the new one. We have an income for those items. We have subtracted items from here. And that is really great. By that, we have automated that invoice reading. You can actually develop this program further by letting it read multiple invoices. Okay, so we can read the directory and then pass it all the paths of our invoices, right? All we need to do is actually when we are reading the invoice, we would pass it the path of the invoice instead. Okay. Like that. And then here we will be having a for loop. It will be sending all the paths for all the files. And then it will process all of these just as usual. Okay. And instead we would be replacing actually the initial file right so here it would be replacing the original database all right 
you have multiple ways to do that. You can either Google how you can. You can either use Python in order to navigate a folder and grab all the files that are in there, which will contain all of your invoices. Or you can simply just create a list of all the paths of all of your files. Let's say file one, that's CSV. Same thing, D. Same thing here. I'm just giving a pseudocode here, file two dot CSV. Just showing you how you can do it. You can just add a for loop here for path n l. Okay, and here you would be passing the path. Okay, and that's it. Now you can have all of your files in here, let's say manually, and you it will go and automatically process all the invoices, or as I said, you can just use Python OS library in order to navigate a folder and grab all of the file names. Congratulations on reaching this far. Most people don't make it here because it's a really long ride, but you did it, so congratulations again. Now that you are familiar with all the basics and intermediate Python tools and libraries, you are ready to jump into what we call data analysis and data pre-processing. Here you will learn how to extract cool insights about any topic as long as you have some data about it in hand. Now, what is data exactly? This is what is this section about and we will find out together. So let's kick off this new section. Hello guys and welcome back to you in this new section where we will be covering data. Now data is all around us. If we would like to take insight about any topic around us, we would need to collect some data, analyze it and visualize it. Now data exists in multiple forms. One of it is text and one other famous form of it is images. And when we talk data science, these are the two main data representation that we would find. So. Any kind of text is data and any type of images is also data. Let me give you an example of text-based data. Let's say that you have a supermarket and you would like to know which product is being sold the most, right? So you would have a table containing, let's say, product one, product two, and you would be having your stock maybe here, how many you have in your stock and how many is sold. And maybe here you have 20, 1, 2, 3. Now, these are statistical data because you are collecting data from so your supermarket, putting it in a table in order to get insight on what is the most sold product in your supermarket. And then maybe you can use this information to increase your sales somehow. So the first step to increase your sales is to actually get an insight on what products you have. Now, let's talk about images. Well, images or data. Let's say that you are trying to build your own handwritten recognition system. In order to do that, you need to collect data first. You need to collect data of all the letters that are handwritten. So every letter could have multiple ways because each person will write it differently. And you need to collect all of these forms and put them in data. Same thing, you have letter B, some people might write it like this. Some people might write it like this. So you need to collect data about all of your letters, right? In order to build a system that can distinguish these from each other, right? Now, after you have collected the data, what you would like to do with it is illustrate it. Now, illustration is the insight. When you illustrate your data, you can visually obtain information on what's going on in your problem. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you want to depict how are the sales for a certain product, right? Let's say you have the y and x axis like that. This is your y. Let's say the x axis is represents the day and here it represents the product amount. Let's say that you are selling milk and you want to track how you are selling milk, okay? So you obtain data on how many you are selling every day. Now let's say that this is these are your data right here. And you can see that they are increasing every day. 
So you have now insights and you can see that they are increasing. If you try to draw a trend line, you'll see that your sales are increasing, right? Maybe it's hard to see it when you only look at numbers, but it's way easier to see it when you are looking at a graph like this. What you can also do is you can write some algorithms to see if there is a pattern where you, maybe you can predict your future sales, right? By drawing a line like this, like this trend line, maybe you can predict your sales in the future. This is called a linear data because the relationship between the day and the product is almost linear, right? Now, there are other type of relationships. Let's say that I have my data here. Let's say that we are trying to predict a repetitive position, right? So here we have time and here we have position. And maybe the data that we are collecting looks like this. This is not linear because if we try to fit a line to it, maybe it will look something like that. Now, this is a nonlinear data. But as you can see, if we take a look, we will see that it is almost repeating itself at certain points, right? So these are maybe distinguishing points because this data is repeating itself. This is why it's important to visualize it. Let me show you another type of data. Let's say that my data is distributed in a certain way. Like if I put images, maybe if I find a way to plot them, I will see that the letter A maybe is clustered here, and maybe I will be seeing that the letter B is clustered right here, right? So when I illustrate this, I will see that the letters are separated in, in this space. So let's say this is letter C, you will see that it is separated as well. And maybe if you apply some techniques, you can cluster them. So maybe you can just draw a cluster here, a cluster here, a cluster here, so that you can maybe predict a future letter, okay? Meaning that you plot your data and you see if they are separated and if they are different from each other. This technique is very important for image processing, for example, especially if you are trying to differentiate different images from each other. If you can find a way to plot an image and represent it, maybe you can plot all of your images then and see if there is a difference between them just by looking at them visually like that. So the whole point of collecting data is to actually visualize it and make sense of it. And this is the focus of this small section. We won't be jumping into data science directly, but I'm going to show you how can we generate artificial data, how we can get data sets, how we can visualize data to make sense of it before we dig into algorithms that will extract more deep and meaningful meaning of our data. So I'm really excited about this section with you guys. Let's get started. Now let us start our data journey. The first thing I want to talk about when talking about data is the linear relationship based data. Meaning that if I try to plot this data, it will be linear. It means that the y and the x have a linear relationship. It could be like this. x is increasing, y is increasing. It could be something like that. Maybe y is decreasing and x is increasing. As you can see, x is increasing here. And if we take a look at y at every point, we see that it is decreasing. Now, the form of this is actually y is equal to mx plus b. Well, we're going to simplify that and we are going to try to generate data from the equation y is equal to 2 times x. What do I mean by 2 times x? It means that if I try to plot a linear relationship between x and y according to this equation here, if x is equal to 1, y is going to be equaling to 2. If x is equal to 2, y is equaling to 4. And then I put these points here 1, here 1, and then we just plot them. Now I know this is a very, very basic math, but I just wanted to show you that for those of you who still don't know what I'm talking about when I say linear relationship. All right, now why am I teaching you how to create artificial data? I mean, isn't it better to get data sets from somewhere and then work on it to show data? We are going to work with data set in a few lectures later, but for now, I wanna be really focusing on artificial data 
because it's very important to understand how can you generate your own artificial data so that you can test it on your models to see if it is working or not. Now the question is, what do I mean by model? We will be talking about machine learning models later in a different section, but for now I want you to focus on how can we generate artificial data. Let's cut into the chase and try to generate a linear relationship. First, I'm going to be importing matplotlib, which is the library we use to plot. Next, we will be importing our famous library, which is NumPy. In order to plot anything, we need the X points and the Y points. All right. Now, I know that the Y points for the function I want to implement is nothing but two times my X points. But how can I generate my X points? You know, X points are nothing but spanning a certain range, maybe between 0 and 10. So if you take a look here, this is 0 and this is 10, right? So I would like to generate data between 0 and 10. How can we generate this data? We need to say mp.lin space. This is the function. You define your starting point, which is 0, your end point, which is 10, and then how many steps. If I say 10 steps, it means that I will be counting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 10. If I say 100 steps, it means that I will be generating data in a step of 0 0.1, meaning that I will be counting 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all the way to 10. Let me test this out for you really quick. If I say print x now, see if the step is 0 0.1, I'm going to be counting in 0 0.1 step all the way to 10. Now, if I make it 10 steps, I'm just going to be generating 0, 1.1, 2.2, 3.3, all the way to 10. All right. Now, let us define our y one more time. It is 2 times x. How can we plot this? All we need to say is, let's continue here. We have import matplotlib dot by plot as plt. Now let's plot this. All we need to say is plt dot plot. We need to pass the x and the y. Now if I hit enter, I will be getting a linear data. How about we show them as a scatter? With a scatter, we will be getting points like this. How about we make them 100 steps? You'll see that now the steps are more condensed into each other. Let's leave it at 10 right now. Now, this is a very, very clean data. And later, we will learn how to create a little bit of noise around that. But for now, this should be a good introduction on how can we create linear function, which we can use as a data. Well, you might ask, what could this data represent? It could represent anything. Let's assume that you have a motor and a temperature sensor. And you would like, as long as your temperature is increasing, you would like your motor rotations per seconds to increase, right? So this could be exactly this line. So as, as I said, there is general forms for the data, which we try to represent in, which is linear, sinusoidal, some functions are nonlinear, which we can represent in a different way. So it's important to know the basic types of functions. As you can see, right now my data is perfectly aligned above each other because we have a perfect relationship here. But data, most of the time, is not really that nice and there is a lot of noise in it. So how can we generate artificial data that is a little bit noisy? Well, first we need to remove this consistency, which is the line space. Second, we need to utilize random number generators. So I'm going to say RNG is equal to mp.random dot random state this will create a random number generator for me the x is nothing but rng dot rand 50 meaning that i want to generate 50 random points now if you want to see what does this return usually it returns 50 data points that are in the range between 0 and 1 okay now let's scale this to be between 0 and 10 so i'm going to multiply it by 10 all right. Now, as you can see, I started to lose the consistency of the points, but they are still perfectly aligned. We need some points to be moving to the right and to the left of my 
line right here what we need to do in order to do that is to change this y to also and add some randomness to it so let's say here i would like to shift this by a certain range all right now let's run this you'll see that now i have lost the consistency of my data it still looks linear but it looks more realistic because data in real life is not really perfect and there is some noise around it exactly like this one now let's try to scale this to three you'll see that the distance is increasing but for me maybe two is enough and good all right now let's try to create some outliers now outliers are points that we would see them outside this nice line because usually when we are having data we might find that a large chunk of our data follows a certain linear pattern but there are still some outliers that are just scattered away around this linear line now how can we generate that well take a look here if i am to print x here not the large x a small x You'll see that I have a list. So how about we add more points to this list so that maybe they can act as an outlier, right? So let's do that. I'm going to say here, let's say outliers x is equal to 0 0.2, 4, and 8. Those are the x points of it. And then we have outliers. Let's say outlier y is equal to, uh, let's say, 5. When we have 4, let's make it maybe 2.5. And when we have 8, well, let's make it 17.5. All right. Now we are going to append these to the x and the y, right? All right. So right now we are going to create a very simple function that is going to take these points from the outliers and just merge them into x. This is very simple. All we need to do is just define a function here. Define add outlier so we need to pass it the x points and then the outlier so we need here the outlier i'm not going to call it x i'm going to call it a list because we need to pass to the same function x's and y's so we're going to say for for item in outlier i would like to add them to l so i'm going to say l dot append item and when we are done we are going to return this l all right now let's merge the x and the outlier x so i'm going to say here x is equal to add outlier and then we would like to pass outlier x and we will do the same thing for y here so we have y and outlier y now let's run this sorry we need to pass the x and the y as well so this is my x this is my y okay now we are getting that there is no attribute append well because here we are using the list append method what i would like to do is to convert this l to a list so l is equal to list l or i could use here the numpy way of appending it doesn't really matter for this example let's run this you'll see that now i have these outliers right here and right here and of course we have one right there okay now we can add as many outliers as we want let's add Let's add another point, maybe here I'm going to say 9, and I would like to put a value very low at maybe 2.7. Uh, You'll see that now I have more outliers. And by that, we can create noisy linear data. Now, I'm going to show you another way to plot these outliers. The reason I have merged them, because when you are creating artificial data you would like your data to be in one list or one array only but if you are only trying to plot it just to show it well you can do the following let's call this x new and this is y new okay because i would like to plot the x y the original x y here and i would like also to plot my outlier x and my outlier y okay i don't want the merged list to be plotted i want to plot the originals and the outliers separately now here i can also specify color is equal to red now if i run this you'll see that this is my original data and here i have my outliers 
How about we talk about polynomial data? Meaning that our data is from degree 2 and up. What do I mean by that? Take a look here. Here we have only one x. If I am to multiply this x with another x, I would be getting a nonlinear data. As you can see, the trend is going up like that. I could multiply it by 3, maybe 3 x's. As you can see, now it's getting more and more nonlinear. We can add some x squared term to it, so x times x. You'll see that the whole trend is changing itself. Let's add one more x. So this is what nonlinear data is. It is when this x is multiplied by multiple times. This is called polynomial. Now how about we switch the side of this like that? Now take a look what happens if I am to multiply this y by a minus. You'll see that the whole data now shifted downward. So now the data is decreasing at y and increasing at x. Removing the minus, we'll see that the x and the y are increasing at the same time. We can change the term here to minus x square and we'll get more interesting shapes. The data we have generated so far are very good if we are trying to create an artificial data for regression. And what I mean by regression is when we are trying to predict how is the line would look like for my certain data. Am I having a nonlinear relationship? Am I having a polynomial here? Or do I have a linear relationship between my data? But not all data science problems are regression or trying to predict a certain point. Some of them is about clustering, meaning my data is scattered around and I would like to create clusters out of them, meaning create regions and each region will represent something to me. Now, how can we create groups of data or clusters next to each other? Well, we are going to be using a library which is called sklearn. Now, sklearn is very famous for data science and machine learning algorithms. They have tons of supported machine learning and data science algorithms. Let's try to create groups of data now. We are going to say from sklearn.data sets import make underscore plops. Okay? Now, this make plops is really, really interesting. Take a look. I need to pass it x and y, and then all I need to say is make plops Blobs is data points. How many data points would I like to create? A hundred. How many centers do I want to create? Two centers, meaning I need two groups of data. We will see what do I mean by two groups in a minute. Then I would like to randomize it. So I'm going to say here random underscore state equals two. And then you can choose the cluster standard deviation. So we'll say here cluster STD is equal to 1.5. Now I'm going to show you step by step. Now I'm going to show you all of these parameters in action. Here it's called centers. Okay, that's good. Now let us plot these. The way to plot this data is by doing the following. I'm going to say plt.scatter. I need to pass x like this. This is for cluster 1. Since I have two clusters, I'm choosing the first cluster now. And then I need to choose the second cluster. Okay, and then we need to choose what is our y, which is my y here, and the parameter for that is called c, and then we have a parameter that is called s, which, all right, this is all we need to do. Now, if I run this, you will see that I got two groups of data. One of them is yellow, right here, and one of them is bluish, which is right here. If I create three centers, I'm going to be getting data that has three centers. So we have three groups of data right now. Let's return it to two. And I'm going to show you what does standard deviation do. If my standard deviation is one, my data will be way too apart from each other. Now, if I make it two, my data is going to get closer and closer to each other. If I make it four, they are merging a lot. So with the choosing the right standard deviation, we can also here choose the amount of noise. Look, when we are working with clustering, what I want to do is, my perfect scenario, I mean, is to have my data as far away as possible. So if I pass here 0 
This is perfect because now I know that these data are away from each other. Now, now let me simplify this to you. Assume that these points represent digits. So these are pictures of digit 0 and these are pictures of digit 1. And this algorithm is trying to distinguish between digit 0 and digit 1, okay? If I try to plot my digits like this, and I see that the distance is too high between my data, it means that I can easily distinguish between zeros and ones images, right? Now, let's assume that here I have 1.2. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is 1.2. As you can see, the data is still well separated, and that's good. And still, here we can easily distinguish that, guys, this, these are the data for 0, and these are the data for 1. Now, let's make it harder. If I make this 1.8, you'll see that we are starting to have very tiny minor overlapping between the two data. It means that when I'm trying to see if these are zeros and ones, I have more probability of making mistakes because some data are very similar to each other. Now, imagine that my data has a standard deviation of 2.5. You'll see that the overlap is higher right now. Maybe the images are not that of a high quality that the zeros and ones are looking alike. Now let's make a four here. This data is this data is way harder now to separate because the amount of overlap between the two data is very large. If I create a cluster standard deviation of eight, well, this is a data that cannot be separated. Because I might have a few points here that can be separated, but most of the points cannot be separated. I cannot really see two distinctive groups that are uh, located away from each other. So this is how we create a group of data. Now let me show you a small trick here. If I pass something called CMAP is equal to RDBU, you will see that my points right now changed color. So here you are saying, I want my points to be red and blue. Now, and this is how we create data that are suitable for clustering algorithms. Now that we have talked about blobs, let's talk about type of data that are circular. How can we create circular data? Let's say that you want to have two clusters. Let's say the first cluster is a large circle and a second cluster is a smaller circle that is in between it. Well, let's see how we can do that. First, we need to import from sklearn.dataset.samples underscore generator import make circles. Okay, now we are going to say x and y is equal to make underscore circles. Open parenthesis, we need 100 points. Now there is something called factor, which we will be talking about in a minute. Let's make it 0 0.5. And we have noise, let it equal 0 0.1. All right, now let's plot them. We're going to say plt.scatter. Same thing, we need to pass x for the first cluster. This is the first cluster. Then we have the second cluster. So we have x, second cluster. Then we have our y. So c is equal to y. And that's it. Now let's plot this. We have an issue. We said knobs instead of noise somewhere. Yeah, here. And as you can see now, we have two circular data. This is cluster one and this is cluster two. This could be to identify the addresses maybe for a city and its suburbs. Let's say that you have the addresses for all the suburbs around the city. And you have the addresses and the geolocation points of all the houses, okay? So by that, you can maybe identify if a certain address is belonging to a suburb or to the small village. Okay, now let's play with these parameters. What is factor? Take a look what happens when we play with factor. This will increase or decrease the spacing between our data. Let's make it 0 0.2. And you'll see that now the spacing is way more. Let's add way more noise. You'll see that there is a pattern of circularity around here, but there is also a lot of overlapping around here. Let's make the noise 0 
we barely now have any noise and it, they are perfectly aligned as two clusters or two groups of data. Well, this is some really nice data that we have plotted so far. We can now artificially almost create anything we want because these three or four forms that we have learned actually covers a lot of statistical problems out there. And if we try to plot their data, we would see them falling into one of those categories. Now, of course, this is not all the shapes. There is a lot of them, but we have covered the basics so far.